This time, the court calls State of Wisconsin versus Stephen Avery, case number 05CF381. Will the party state repeat for the record, please? Good morning, Judge. The State of Wisconsin appears by Calumet County District Attorney Ken Kratz, Lead Counsel, and appearing as Special Prosecutor in this case. Appearing with me include Tom Fallon, an Assistant Attorney General from the Department of Justice, and Norm Gahn, an Assistant District Attorney from Milwaukee County, Wisconsin, also appearing as Special Prosecutor. And good morning. Stephen Avery appears in person. He's represented by Jerome Buting, immediately to my left, and I am Dean Strang. All right. We're here this morning. Before we bring the jurors out, first of all, to discuss any comment the parties have on the open instructions that have been provided by the court. Before we get to that, are there any other issues that either party feels should be addressed before the jurors are brought in? The one logistical issue I had was during the opening statements and the closing arguments, the clerk, Ms. Bonin, has a switch near her, which is called public seating or something of that nature. I'm going to ask that that switch, and I got the approval of the sheriff for that, quite frankly, judge, with PowerPoint or other presentations in this area, the gallery and other spectators find it much easier to see those without that one bank of lights, the public seating lights. If Ms. Bonin would like to try that at this point so the court can see, I would appreciate that. Go ahead. I think Mr. Buting indicated he has no objection. It just provides less glare and an opportunity for those in the public to observe what it is that we're talking about. Again, I suggest that just for openings and closings. All right, any objections? There is not. Anything else to take up before we address the opening instructions? My thought is that we might take Mr. Avery's personal statement on waiving or not waiving but stipulating to the second element of count three of the second, amend, uh, second amended information. Very well. For the record, I will note the court has previously been informed that the defendant intended to stipulate to the second element of the possession of firearm charge. That is, the defendant's status as having been convicted of a felony before November 5th of 2005. Before I notify the jury that the defendant is making that stipulation, the court has to make sure that the defendant is doing so knowingly and voluntarily. So, Mr Avery, I'm going to be addressing these questions to you. Before the court accepts your stipulation to one of the elements of the felon in possession of a firearms charge, I'm going to be asking you a few questions. If you have any trouble understanding any questions that I ask, let me know and I will let you speak with your attorneys. Mr Avery, do you understand you have the right to a jury tri trial in this case, and that includes the right to acquire the state to prove every element of each offence charged beyond a reasonable doubt to all members of the jury. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. You understand that in the case of a felon in possession of a firearms charge, this means that you can, if you wish, require the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you were convicted of a felony before November 5th of 2005. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Do you further understand that if you wish, you can stipulate, that is, you can agree that you were convicted of a felony before November 5th of 2005 and make further evidence on that issue irrelevant. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. Do you wish to waive your right to a jury trial on that element? This is, agree that you were convicted of a felony before November 5th of 2005. Yes, I do. Have you had adequate opportunity to discuss this decision with your attorneys? Yes. And have your attorneys explained to, explained to you your right to a jury trial on this element? Yes. Has anyone made any promises or threats to you to give up your right to a jury trial on this element 
of the firearms charge? No. Do you understand each of the questions that I have asked you and what your attorneys have told you about this matter? Yes. Mr Strang, have you had adequate opportunity to discuss this matter with your client? Yes. And do you believe that Mr Avery is knowingly and voluntarily giving up his right to a jury trial on this particular element of the possession of a firearms charge? On that element, yes, I do. Very well. The court does find that the defendant has knowingly and voluntarily waived his right to a jury trial on the second element of the felon in possession of a firearms charge, and the court will accept the defendant's stipulation on that element. For the record, Judge, the state also acquiesces and accepts the stipulation. Thank you. As I indicated previously, I have provided the parties with a copy of the court's proposed opening instructions, and it's the court's understanding that those proposed proposed instructions are acceptable to each of the parties with the exception of some language involving the elements of the crime on the two accounts that are charged as party to the crime. First counsel, am I correct in that understanding? Yes, Judge. Although the state, as Mr. Gahn and Mr. Fallon and I have spoken, and after our brief conversation in chambers, we are asking the court adopt a very similar series of language that the court has proposed in its last submission. I'll be happy to put our ideas on the record, but you are correct, Judge. There is one change that we're requesting. All right. And Mr. Strang? We were satisfied with the whole of the court's final proposed instructions to be given pre preliminarily, and we object to the modification that the state has offered. All right. I will hear from the state first, then on the proposed modification. Thank you, Judge. The substantive changes that we're asking is that toward the bottom of page six of the preliminary instructions, when the court reads the element of the offense for first degree intentional homicide as a party to the crime, the court submit the following language. That Stephen Avery caused the death of Teresa Hawbach or aided and abetted Brendan Dassey in causing the death of Teresa Halbach. As we have indicated throughout the jury selection process, and in fact, in motions before trial, whether Mr. Dassey testifies in this case at all, or whether Brendan Dassey is to be referred to at all in this trial is still very much at issue. To highlight or alert the jury that Brendan Dassey is the individual from which Mr. Avery acted in concert, we believe to be inappropriate and would, as some of the jurors quite candidly indicated in jury selection, suggest that the state should, for whatever reason, be calling Mr. Dassey as a witness, notwithstanding his Fifth Amendment rights not to do so or against self-incrimination. We're therefore judge asking that the elements re read that Stephen Avery caused the death of Teresa Halbach or aided and abetted another in causing the death of Teresa Halbach. Similar language would be inserted into the second element, again, removing the words Brendan Dassey and inserting the words another. That provides no prejudice to the defense. It's an accurate statement of the law and, again, removes the suggestion that the state in some way has a burden or obligation, or even practically speaking, should call Mr. Dassey or insert Mr. Dassey into this case. Lastly, Judge, if the court adopts that change, then the statement or comment as to unanimous agreement not being required, further up on the page, on page number six, is in fact appropriate, is required. And we would ask, I think that's joined by Mr. Strang, that that instruction be reinserted and added in the preliminary instructions. Mr. Strang, well, just before I get to Mr. Strang, Mr. Kratz, what is the language? I'm looking at page six, element one. What language exactly is the state proposing? 
just instead of the name Brandon Dassey, you are just exchanging that with the uh, with the word another. Just a second. Aided and abetted another in the commission of the crime. I think that's a correct statement of the law. And as I mentioned, Judge, removing the suggestion that the state have an obligation to set forth its theory of the prosecution when it may very well be that Mr. Dassey not testify in this case. So, you are proposing to read Stephen Avery caused the death of Teresa Hallback or aided and abetted another in causing the death. That's right. And with respect to the other reference to Mr. Dassey in this count and the other count, you are proposing that in each case it be replaced with another. Yes, Judge. Mr. Strang. How I wish that on March 2nd, 2006, the state had thought it as inappropriate to pair Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery in the commission of these crimes as it thinks it today. And the 11 months of prejudicial publicity that we have had, perhaps we would have been spared if the state thought then that it was inappropriate to link these two together as co-actors, accomplices in the death of Theresa Holbeck. Today, it's too late to do that. To now insert the ambiguous term another, which potentially includes the whole world, is to invite the very speculation about who an accomplice may have been or who a third party culprit may have been that the state successfully opposed when we made a fairly elaborate proffer on possible third party actors. Up through that motion, it was the state's position that Brendan Dassey and Brendan Dassey only was the possible third party or accomplice in this crime. And now, on no showing at all of the potential culpability of another, the state proposes to throw open the field of possible accomplice liability to the entire world. That's not fair. It's not consistent with the positions the state has taken to date, and it leaves Mr Avery, on the one hand, unable to suggest directly the liability of a third person, and yet, on the other hand, defending a potentially shifting or unstated theory on who his accomplice or accessory may have been. The state's choices on this case and on the history of it before seems to me pretty clear. Either stick with Brendan Dassey as the man you think is the accomplice and prove it, or drop the party to a crime allegation in count one and count two altogether and prove that Stephen Avery committed this crime without allowing him to run the risk of accessory as a liability to a phantom. Those seem to me the two legitimate choices. That's why we accepted and agreed with and thought accurate the court's final draft of the preliminary jury instructions. We equally would accept a redraft that struck the party to a crime theory altogether, but that's the state's choice to make. It's allowed to decide on what theory of liability it will proceed. It is not allowed on the morning of opening statements to back away from the man it has roped to Stephen Avery for 11 months and say, could have been anybody, just another, just not fair. And I would ask the court to leave the instructions as they are, unless the state wishes to drop the party to the crime theory in, of liability in which case the instructions would be confined to Stephen Avery alone. As to unanimous agreement, I don't know that I have talked with the state about this at all and, in fact, I don't think that unanimous agreement required should be added back. The courts had struck it, it should remain stricken, and the reason is really very straightforward. Understanding that there is Wisconsin law to the contrary. My view of the due process requirement in the 14th Amendment and the right to a unanimous verdict that it embraces is that the jury, all 12, must be unanimous on whether the defendant is the principal, 
the defendant directly committed the crime or whether he was an accessory that is an aider and a better. Now I agree for purposes of discussion in the abstract that which of two means of aiding and abetting that Wisconsin law recognises, those, let's assume for the sake of argument, jurors need not agree on unanimously. Once they have decided unanimously that it is as a party to the crime rather than as the principle that the defendant has been proven guilty. But this instruction allows jurors to differ and to return a verdict that is not unanimous on the fundamental question of whether one is a principal or liable as an accessory, an aider, a better, or a party to the crime. Unanimity instruction, therefore, ought not to be given at all at this point. By final instructions, I'm confident that the parties and the court, in the end, can draft an instruction that treats unanimity properly. All right. There appear to be two points that separate the parties, and I'm going to rule as follows. First of all, before I indicate the court's decision, I think it's important to note that what we're talking about here is not the closing instructions that the jury is going to get when it's time to deliberate on the verdict, but rather opening instructions, the purpose of which is simply to make it easier for the jurors to follow the evidence and understand what is in, what is the state has to prove in order to justify the guilty verdict. With that thought in mind, I think it's best to steer clear of converted issues that may be clarified as the evidence comes in. The instructions the court gives in the opening are not necessary the instructions that will be given to in the closing. It's easier to be more specific at the time once the court knows what evidence is. For those reasons, I'm going to actually, I previously changed the elements of the crime language on the two party to the crime charges based on the format submitted by the defence. I'm going to continue to use the defence format, but I will substitute another for Brendan Darcy. I agree, it's not a good idea that the start of a trial to focus attention on Mr. Darcy, although I understand that the basis of the state's party to the crime theory when the closing instructions are given, depending on how the evidence comes in, the request being made by the defence may well be appropriate. But for purpose of the opening instructions, which are simply to outline the elements that the state must prove, I don't think that level of specificity is required. With respect to humanity language, as I indicated to the parties in prior correspondence, while the comment to the parties to the crime instruction would suggest that the humanity requirement is appropriate, the court has not had a chance to fully address the defence arguments, and there are arguments to the contrary that I believe must be addressed before the court is in action to make a final decision. It's not necessary during the open instructions to tell the juror whether or not they have to be unanimous. The instructions are, to, are intended to help them follow evidence. Therefore, I am not going to include the unanimity instruction language in the opening instructions. I did previously reword the opening language to the substantive instructions to notify the jurors that the court is going to be reading proportions of the specific jury instructions. So certainly the possibil possibil possibility is left open that the, the humanity language can be inserted in the closing instructions. I believe that addresses the party's comments with respect to the opening instructions. Is there anything else either party feels should be addressed before we bring in the jurors and swear the jury? Judge, one housekeeping matter. I don't know if you have reminded the jurors or perhaps, um, excuse me, the public as they were brought in but without an interest in having a Mike Sherman moment, perhaps all cell, <clears throat> excuse me, perhaps all cell phones should be turned off. I don't know if that was something. Actually, the court has ordered that no cell phones be permitted in the courtroom, and I trust the folks guarding the entrance to the door have enforced that requirement. And the attorneys as well, Judge. At least the state has taken care of that. And that's the only other comment we have. Thank you.
Anything else from the defence? Nothing here, Your Honour. If not, we can have the jury brought in. Good morning, jurors. You can be seated for a brief period of time. The court has already called this morning the case of the State of Wisconsin versus Stephen A, case number 05C5381. In a minute, I'm going to read to you some opening instructions in the case, but before we do that, the clerk will swear. So at this time, I will ask you to please rise. If you all would raise your right hand, please be seated. Members of the jury, before the trial begins, there are certain instructions you should have to better understand your functions as a juror and how you should conduct yourself during the trial. Your, ju your duty is to decide the case based only on the evidence presented and the law given to you by the court. Do not let any personal feelings of bias or prejudice about such things as race, religion, national origin, sex or age affect your deliberations. Do not begin your deliberations and discuss of the case until the evidence, all the evidence is presented and I have instructed you on the law. Do not discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. We'll stop or recess from time to time during the trial. You may be excused from the courtroom when it is necessary for me to hear legal arguments from the lawyers. If you come into contact with any of the parties, lawyers or witnesses, do not speak with them. For their part, parties, lawyers and witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. As the court has previously informed you, the jury will not be sequestered during this trial. The decision is dependent on the jurors not listening to, watching or reading any news accounts of the case during the trial, nor discussing it with anyone, including members of your family or other jurors. For, those re for these reasons, it is vital that you do not listen to any conversation about the case. Do not read any newspaper or internet reports or listen to any news reports on radio or television about this trial. To ensure that you are not exposed to improper media coverage, the court is ordering that, for the duration of a trial, you do not watch the local news on television, do not listen to the local news on the radio, do not read the newspaper unless you first have someone remove any articles about the case. In addition, do not visit any internet websites or web logs which may include any information about the case. Should you be exposed to any reports or communications from any source concerning the case during the trial, you should report that information to the jury bailiff. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene. Do not engage in any experimentation or research relating to any issues, facts or persons involved in the case. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, websites or other reference materials for any additional information. The court is aware that many of you have been exposed to publicity concerning this case before you were selected to serve as a juror. Each of you has committed to base your verdict only on the evidence introduced during the trial. It is of vital importance to the parties and to the sanctity of the court to process that you remain true to this commitment. Anything you may see or hear outside the courtroom is not evidence. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence that is offered and received at trial. Evidence is defined as, first, the sworn testimony of witnesses, both on direct cross-examination, regardless of who called the witness. Second, the exhibits the court has received. And third, any facts to which the lawyers have agreed or stipulated or which the court has directed you to find. Attorneys, for each side, have the right and the duty to object to whatever they consider improper questions asked of a witness and to the admission of other evidence which they believe is not properly admissible. You should draw any conclusions from the fact an objection was made by allowing testimony or other evidence to be received over the objection of counsel. The court is not indicating any opinion about the evidence you jurors are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight of the evidence. You are not required to, but you may take notes during this trial except during the opening statements and the closing arguments. The court will provide you with materials for this purpose. In taking notes, you must be careful that it does not distract you from the carefully listening to and observing the witnesses.
You may rely on your notes to refresh your memory during the deliberations, otherwise keep them confidential. Your notes will be collected by the jury bailiff after each day's session and kept in a secure place until the next day of trial. After trial, the notes will be collected and destroyed. You will not have a copy of the written transcript of the trial testimony available for use during your deliberations. You may ask to have specific portions of a testimony read to you. You should pay Careful attention to all the testimony because you must rely primarily on your memory of the evidence and the testimony introduced during the trial. It is the duty of the jury to scrutinise and to weigh the testimony of witnesses and determine the effect of the evidence as a whole. You are the sole judges of the credibility, that is, believability of the witnesses and of the weight to be given to their testimony. In determining the credibility of each witness, and the weight you give to the testimony of each witness, consider these factors. Whether the witness has an interest or lack of interest in the result of the trial. The witness conduct, appearance and demeanour on the witness stand. The clearance or lack of clearness of the witness recollections. The opportunity the witness had for observing and knowing the matters the witness testified about. The reasonableness of the witness testimony the apparent intelligence of the witness, bias or prejudice, if any has been shown, possible motives for falsifying testimony, and all other factors, excuse me, all other facts and circumstances during the trial which tend either to support or to discredit the testimony. Then give to the testimony of each witness the weight you believe it should receive. There is no magic way for you to evaluate the testimony. Instead, you should use your common sense and experience. In everyday life, you determine for yourselves the reliability of things people say to you. You should do the same thing here. To assist you in evaluating the evidence, I will now read to you proportions of specific jury instructions for the offences which the defendant is charged. I will read them to you in their entirety at the close of the evidence. Count 1 of the information charges of the defendant with a first degree intentional homicide as part of the crime. Section 939 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin provides that whoever is concerned in the commission of a crime as a party to that crime and may be convicted of that crime although that person did not directly commit it. The state contends that the defendant was coherent concerned in the commission of the crime of first degree intentional homicide by either directly committing it or by intentionally aiding and abetting the person who directly committed it. If a person intentionally aids and abets the commission of a crime, then that person is guilty of the crime as well as the person who directly committed it. A person intentionally aids and abets the commission of a crime when acting with knowledge or belief that another person is committing or intends to commit a crime, he knowingly either assists the person who commits the crime or is ready and willing to assist the person who commits the crime knows of the willingness to assist. To intentionally aid and abet the crime of first degree intentional homicide, the defendant must know that, that another person is committing or intends to commit the crime of first degree intentional homicide and have the purpose to assist in the commission of that crime. Before you may find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide as a party to the crime, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant directly committed the crime or intentionally aided and abetted the commission of the crime. First degree intentional homicide found in section 940.01 of the Animal Code of Wisconsin is committed by one who causes the death of another human being with intent to kill that person or another. Before you may find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements were present. One, Stephen Avery caused the death of Teresa Holbach or aided and abetted another in causing the, the death of Teresa Holbach. Cause means that the defendant act act was a substantial factor in producing the death. 2. Stephen Avery acted with the intent to kill Teresa Holbach whether he did so directly or aided and abetted by another. Intent to kill means that the defendant had the mental purpose 
to take the life of another human being or was aware that his conduct was particularly certain to cause the death of another human being, where the law requires that the defendant acted with intent to kill, it does not require that the intent exists for any particular length of time before the act is committed. The act need not be brooded over, considered or reflected upon for a week, a day, an hour or even a minute. There need not be any appropriate time between the information of the intent and the act. The, in the intent to kill may be formed at any time before the act, including the instance before the act, and must continue to exist at the time of the act. You cannot look into a person's mind to find intent. Intent to kill must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words and statements, if any and all from the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon intent. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary to prove a conviction, proof of motive, motive is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something, while motive may be shown as a circumstance to aid in establishing the guilt of a defendant. The state is not required to prove motive on the part of a defendant in order to convict. Evidence of motive does not, by itself, establish guilt. You should give it the weight you believe it deserves under all the circumstances. If you are satisfied, beyond a reasonable doubt, at the conclusion of the trial that the defendant directly committed both elements of the first degree intentional homicide, you should find the defendant guilty. If you are not satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. Count 2 charges the defendant with mutilating a corpse, also as a party to the crime. The state contends that the defendant was concerned in the commission of, of the crime of mutilating a corpse by either directly committing it or by intentionally aiding or abetting the person who committed it. Before you may find the defendant guilty of mutilating a corpse as a party to the crime, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the, the directly committed the crime of mutilating a corpse or intentionally aided and abetted the commission of that crime. Mutilating a corpse, as defined in the section 940.11-1 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin, is violated by one who mutilates a corpse with intent to conceal a crime or avoid apprehension prosecution or conviction for a crime. Before you may find the defendant guilty of this offence, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements were present. 1. Stephen Avery mutilated the corpse of Teresa Hallback or aided and betted another in mutilating the corpse of Teresa Hallback. 2. In mutilating the corpse of Teresa Hallback or in aiding and abetting Another in mutilating a corpse, Stephen Avery, with the intent to conceal a crime. This requires that the defendant acted with the purpose to conceal a crime. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt at the conclusion of the trial that Stephen Avery directly committed both elements of this offence, you should find the defendant guilty. If you are not satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. Count 3 charges the defendant with a felon in possession of a firearm. Section 941.29 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin is violated by a person who possesses a firearm that if that person has been convicted of a felony. Before you may find the defendant guilty of this offence, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements were present. 1. The defendant possessed a firearm. Firearms means a weapon which acts by the force of gunpowder. It is not necessary that the firearm was loaded or capable of being fired. Possesses means that the defendant knowingly had physical, physical control of a firearm. An item is in a person's possession if it is in an area over which the person has control and the person intends to exercise control over the item. Two. The second element is that the defendant had been convicted of a felony before November 5, 2005. The parties in this case have agreed that Stephen Avery was convicted of a felony before November 5, 2005 and you must accept this conclusively 
proved. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the conclusion, conclusion of the trial, that both elements of the offence have been proved, you should find the defendant guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. The final count charges the defendant with false imprisonment. False imprisonment as defined in section 940.30 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin is committed by one who intentionally confines or restrains another without the person's consent and with knowledge that he has no lawful authority to do so. Before you may find the defendant guilty of this offence, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following five elements were present. One, the defendant confined or restrained Teresa Hobart during her lifetime. Two, the defendant confined or restrained Teresa Hobart intentionally. This requires that the defendant have the mental purpose to confine or restrain Teresa Hobart. Three, Teresa Hobart was confined or restrained without her consent. Four, the defendant had no lawful authority to confine or restrain Teresa Hobart. Five, the defendant knew that Teresa Hobart did not consent and knew that he did not have lawful authority to confine or restrain Teresa Hobart. Although this requires genuine restraint or confinement, it does not require that it be in a jail or prison. If the defendant deprived Teresa Hobart of freedom of movement or compelled her to remain where she did not wish to remain, then Teresa Hobart was confined or restrained. The use of physical force is not required. One may be confined or restrained by acts or words or both. You cannot look into a person's mind to find out the intent or knowledge. Intent and knowledge must be found, if at all, from the defendant's acts, words and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon intent and knowledge. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt at the conclusion of a trial that all five elements of this offence have been proved, excuse me, have been proved, you should find the defendant guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. In reaching your verdict, examine the evidence with care and caution. Act with judgment, reason and prudence. Defendants are not required to prove their innocence. The law presumes that every person charged with the commission of an offence is innocent. This presumption requires a finding of not guilty unless your deliberations you find it is overcome by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. The burden of establishing every fact necessary to constitute guilt is upon the state. Before you can return a verdict of guilty, the evidence must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the defendant's innocence, you should do so and return the verdict of not guilty. The term reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given arising from a fair, rational consideration of the evidence or lack of evidence. It means such a doubt as would cause a person of ordinary prudence to pause or hesitate when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt which is based on mere guesswork or speculation, a doubt which arises merely from sympathy or from fear to return a verdict of guilt is not a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt such as may be used to escape the responsibility of a decision. While it is your duty to give the defendant the benefit of every reasonable doubt, you are not to search for doubt, you are to search for the truth. As you know, although this is a Manitowoc County case with a Manitowoc County jury, the case is being tried at the Calumet County Courthouse. You will learn that when Stephen Avery became a suspect in this case, the Manitowoc County District Attorney turned control of this case over to Calumet County District Attorney because Mr Avery had a lawsuit pending against Manitowoc County at this time. For logistical reasons, the parties jointly requested that the trial be held in Calumet County and the court granted that request. You should draw no inference for or against either party to this case because of the location of the trial or the fact that it has not been prosecuted by the Manitowoc County District Attorney.
In a few minutes, the lawyers will make opening statements. The purpose of opening statements is to give the lawyers an opportunity to tell you what they expect the evidence will show, so what you will better understand the evidence as it is introduced during the trial. I must caution you, however, that the opening statements are not evidence. At this time, we're going to make a very short break so that the state may get its equipment ready to present the opening statements. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Five minutes, Council. You may be seated, members of the jury. At this time, we're going to hear the opening statements from the state. Mr. Cratch, you may begin. Thank you, Judge. May it please the court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Mr. Strang, Mr. Buting, Mr. Avery, good morning. Good morning. We're all a little nervous this morning, and I think that if we admit that, we, being the lawyers and the jurors, as to decide this important matter, I think we're all going to be better off. And on behalf of the state, let me first start by thanking you. Thanking you for your jury service. Thanking you for your attention that you are about to give in this case. And thanking you in detail for what in jury selection we talked about may perhaps be the most important decision that you will ever make, at least for the rest of your lives. You will note, and we have already introduced, that there are three attorneys on this case. Myself, Ken Kratz, the Calumet County District Attorney. This is my courthouse, and I'm joined by Mr. Fallon, who is seated directly to my right. Mr. Fallon is an Assistant Attorney General with the Department of Justice. And joining us also is Mr. Norm Gahn. Good morning. Mr. Gahn is an Assistant District Attorney in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. You will learn that each of us are special prosecutors in this case. But what's so special about a special prosecutor? Why would some small town lawyer from Chilton be in charge of this entire prosecution? This big of a case? Why would Ken Kratz be asked to lead up this prosecution? We'll talk about how this case was assigned over, but just understand, at least for this person, that although we are all experienced prosecutors, we're doing a favor for Manitowoc County. It's a rather big favor for Manitowoc County, but it's a favor nonetheless. It is helping the Manitowoc County District Attorney's Office in presenting this case. Mr. Rohr, your District Attorney, asked me to take over the case early on. You will learn about when that happened, but it is still something that we were simply asked to, and we did, in fact, perform. There's two investigators in this case. Now, you're going to hear that there were hundreds of law enforcement officers involved in this investigation, but these kinds of cases require direction. They require leadership by law enforcement officials that have experience. The first lead investigator in the case, who is seated in the courtroom, is Mark Wiegert. Mr. Wiegert. Good morning, Attorney Kratz. Mr. Wiegert is an investigator with the Calumet County Sheriff's Department. The other lead investigator in this case is Tom Fassbender. Mr. Fassbender works for the Department of Justice. He works for a law enforcement branch of the Department of Justice, which is called the Division of Criminal Investigation. And again, knowing who we are, knowing who the five of us are, the prosecution team, we hope may help in determining what's important in these cases. The judge has told you, at least in brief terms, what an opening statement is. But oftentimes, evidence comes in in bits and pieces, especially in a six-week trial. 
that isn't something that you will expect all of the evidence to come at you at once. And so if we can provide a roadmap or an overview of what the evidence is going to show, that should be helpful for you. Some juries that I have spoken to, it's been helpful to describe this process as the provision of the cover of a jigsaw puzzle box. All right? You think of evidence as pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. You wouldn't tell if you were handed one piece of a jigsaw puzzle where that's going to go. But if you got the box, and if you have the box, some of the pieces are obvious where they go. Some are not so obvious. But at least it's a guide. It's a help for you as to where these pieces all fit. Now, before I go any further, I want to talk to you about something that I know some of you, in your specific questions, expressed as some concern, and that's the nature of the evidence that's going to be presented. This is a very, very serious crime and potentially has very, very graphic kinds of details that may be involved or may be presented. But there is some uncertainty about how much evidence is going to be presented. And I wanted to assure you, as the lead prosecutor, as the person responsible for the presentation of the case, a couple of things. Number one, and perhaps most importantly for you as the jury, I'm only going to present those pieces of evidence that are necessary those pieces that are necessary to tell you the entire story. My job is not to present gruesome or overly graphic information for you. And I think as we go through this process, you're going to find that the evidence is pretty straightforward. It's not necessarily gruesome or graphic. Is it something that you should fear at this early stage, all right? I understand the sensitivities, not only of you, but of most of the people seated on the left-hand side of the courtroom, and I, actually, I want you to look over to the left side of the courtroom. That's the Halbach family. You're going to see them throughout the case, friends and family, and I want to assure you that before the first piece of evidence is ever introduced in this case, every one of those people, the mother, the father, the brothers, the sisters, the friends, and any other family members that wanted to, have already seen all of this evidence, all right? I sat down with them, and as sensitively as I possibly could, allowed them an opportunity to review the evidence. That's just something that a prosecutor should do, and that's all been done. So as you see photographs being presented, as you see physical evidence being brought into the courtroom, I want to assure you that the Haubach family already has seen it. They've already known the kinds of evidence that are going to be presented, and I think that that was necessary for you to hear and necessary for you to understand that this family does have that information. The judge has told you that there's four charges. I'm very, very briefly going to talk about those four because I don't want to reiterate what the judge did, but there are four separate charges that the defendant is charged with. First degree, intentional homicide mutilation of a corpse, felon in possession of a firearm, and false imprisonment. Now, the judge instructed you, and my job today in opening statement, again, this is an evidence, but it is a help for you. It's the cover, if you will. It's the road map. It's the overview. To talk about the first legal concept that you as a jury has to understand. And that's the concept called being a party to the crime. 
The judge has told you that that can be satisfied either if the defendant committed an offense himself or if the defendant aided and abetted another in the commission of the offense. Now, the first two counts, the homicide and the mutilation of a corpse, are charged as a party to the crime. And so you will learn at the conclusion of this case, six weeks from now, if you fast forward six weeks from now, that the jury instructions will tell you that if the defendant committed any of those elements himself, or if the defendant aided in another, another, excuse me, aided and abetted another in the commission of those offenses, that you can and should find him guilty. Now, I can't stand up here and predict what the defense is going to bring into this case, what cross-examination they may encounter, or if they even choose to present any kind of a defense, nor should I. That isn't my job. My job as the prosecutor is to present our case, to present the physical evidence that we have developed to present the witnesses that we have developed to prove our case. But just understand and just remember this concept when it comes time to deciding whether or not the defendant is guilty. The judge also told you about something called elements of the of the offense, offense. The state has the burden of proof here. The defense has absolutely no burden and our burden is to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The judge explained to you already that beyond a reasonable doubt means a doubt for which a reason can be given when considering all the evidence. Let me tell you what it is not, though. Beyond a reasonable doubt is not beyond all doubt. It's not 100%. And when we are dealing with a human justice system, you can't expect beyond all doubt or beyond a shadow of a doubt or comments sometimes that we have heard about that. It's beyond a reasonable doubt, a doubt for which a reason can be given. And I'm standing before you, members of the jury, telling you that I accept that burden. I will prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. But we didn't want you going into this case expecting 100% or beyond all doubt because there are human factors or dynamics that go into these cases. Each charge, the judge told you, has elements of those offense. We're going to go through those in just a minute, but also Each of the four charges should be considered separately. You shouldn't group them together and decide if he is guilty of all four or none. Each of the four counts are to be considered separately. And in fact, there is separate evidence for all four of those counts. And finally, the defendant is presumed innocent. As Mr. Avery sits here today, because you have heard no evidence in this case. He is presumed by you, or should be presumed by you, to be innocent. However, and this is a big however, that presumption disappears at that very moment when the evidence in this case satisfies you, beyond a reasonable doubt, that he is guilty of that offense. That presumption disappears at the moment that the evidence proves that he is guilty. Count one, the judge instructed you, has two elements. And why I'm telling you this and why I'm showing them on the screen or on a PowerPoint presentation is because these are serious, serious crimes. In fact, the most serious crimes that we have in the state of Wisconsin. The legal concepts aren't all that complex. We are talking about two things that we have to prove. Cause the death of somebody 
and did it intentionally. Nothing magic about that. Nothing complex about that. And all of you should be able to understand that. The same thing with mutilation of a corpse. Just the two elements, that he mutilated a corpse and that he did so to conceal a crime that has been committed. You will hear evidence in this case about what that crime was that he was trying to conceal. The crime, as you may have already guessed, is the first degree intentional homicide. Mr. Avery is also charged with felon in possession of a firearm. Again, two elements. The felon in possession. First, that he possessed the firearm. That seems obvious. And number two, that sometime before November of 2005, he had been convicted of a felony. Now, the judge has told you that that second element is stipulated. Stipulation means that the facts are agreed to by the parties. That you can take that has that as already having been proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Avery has that felony conviction. And so it's just the first element of that offense that the state has to prove. Do you all understand that? All right. Now, false imprisonment has five separate elements to the offense. Those five elements are that he confined or restrained. Note that that's in the disjunctive. He either confined or restrained Teresa Hobbock intentionally without her consent. He didn't have authority, and he knew that he didn't have authority to confine or restrain Ms. Hobbock. All right, enough of the civics lesson. Let's talk about what the evidence is going to show. On Monday, October 31st, 2005, beginning at approximately 2.45 p.m., the state intends to prove to you that the defendant restrained, murdered, and mutilated a 25-year-old photographer named Teresa Habach. We're going to prove to you what happened. We're going to prove to you who committed this crime. We're going to prove to you where it happened. We're going to prove to you when specifically it happened. And those will prove all of the elements of the offense. What we're not going to prove to you, what the judge has already told you, we don't have to, and in fact, can't prove to you, is why. We can't prove the why in this, in a case like this. That's called motive, the reason behind the killing. What was in Mr. Avery's mind when he decided to kill this lovely young woman? I'm going to introduce to you, to somebody. This remarkable young woman was 25 years of age. She was single. She was a freelance photographer. She had her own photography business that was although in its infancy, was doing quite well. This woman, and I will remind you several times in this opening and throughout the trial, I will remind you that we're talking about a real person. We're talking about somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, a lot of people's friend. Teresa Habach had her whole life in front of her and the evidence is going to show that on Halloween of 2005, that all ended, that ended in the hands of the defendant, Stephen Avery. It's such a big case with such a big job that we have to try to present all of this investigation. I'm going to start from the beginning and I'm going to start talking about the investigation itself. Ms. Habach was reported missing on the 3rd of November, 2005. Ms. Habach worked for uh, at least part of her photography business was that she worked for a publication called Auto Trader Magazine. 
You're going to learn through the case, and you're going to hear from several witnesses from Auto Trader that it is a magazine that basically is responsible for selling automobiles, some other things, trailers and the like, but mostly automobiles. And it's a publication that Teresa supplemented her income with. Teresa was mostly responsible or mostly enjoyed taking photographs of weddings and was already developing quite a niche and quite a specialty taking pictures of little kids, of babies and young children. But to supplement her young business, she worked for Auto Trader Magazine. So to understand how this case transforms from a missing person investigation into what became one of the largest criminal investigations in Wisconsin history, starting from the beginning, we're starting from the investigation. It's, a, it's important for you to understand. The investigation determined that Teresa Habach took three pictures, or at least had three business stops, on the 31st of October. Now, one of those were a person by the name of Mr. Schmitz. One of those was a person by the name of Mr. Zipperer. And the third and the last stop that she made late in the afternoon on the 31st was at the Stephen Avery Salvage property. The investigation early on determined that this man, Stephen Avery, called Auto Trader Magazine at 8.12 that morning on that very day, on the 31st of October. And Mr. Avery asked specifically that the same woman who had been out here before, the same woman who on at least six and perhaps more occasions had come out to take pictures. Mr. Avery wanted her out there the afternoon of the 31st. Now, two very critical findings very early on in this investigation came to light. Number one, that Stephen Avery was the one who lured Miss Halbach out to the property on the 31st. But number two, and perhaps as importantly, Stephen Avery was the last person to see Teresa Halbach alive. Who is this man? The judge told you that there was a lawsuit which was filed against Manitowoc County, and many of you, in fact, virtually all of you, knew something about Stephen Avery before serving on this particular jury. Mr. Avery ach achieved some degree of notoriety back in 2003 when he was exonerated for a 1985 sexual assault conviction. You should know that that exoneration was based upon DNA evidence. You should know that that DNA evidence was performed by the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory and it was performed by an analyst, the head of the DNA unit in Madison, a woman by the name of Sherry Colhane. I want you to remember that name because you're going to hear that name later on in this case. Mr. Avery, as you already heard, later filed a civil lawsuit against Manitowoc County seeking compensation, seeking money for the, excuse me, for the time that, that he was wrongfully convicted. And it's that degree of notoriety, that's how Mr. Avery comes to you in this case. That may or may not have some things to do with this case. Now. We understand, and the evidence is going to be clear, that Mr. Avery never should have been convicted in 1985 based on eyewitness or mistaken eyewitness testimony, that there wasn't any DNA evidence, at least the DNA analysis wasn't to the level or to the point that it is now, and certainly isn't anything like you're going to hear about in this case, and in fact, should have been exonerated and was in 2003. We'll also tell you 
and at the close of this case, I'm going to point to every one of you presenting jurors and say that that has absolutely nothing to do with this case. When deciding who is accountable for the death of 25-year-old Teresa Habach, Mr. Avery's past and his past exoneration have nothing to do with this case. Ms. Habach, as you have heard, or she comes in this case as the part of a missing persons investigation. Now, Calumet County and Mr. Wiegert, as a matter of fact, was in charge of that missing persons investigation early on. That's through the third and the fifth. Those parts of the missing persons investigation that happened in Calumet County are Calumet County law enforcement's responsibility. Those parts of the missing persons investigation that happened in Manitowoc County necessarily and appropriately are Manitowoc County's responsibility. When looking for a 25-year-old freelance photographer, there is nothing improper about Manitowoc County being involved in that case. You're going to learn, however, that on the 5th, on the 5th of November, at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, afternoon, Judge Jerome Fox Another judge from Manitowoc County, one of the three sitting judges in Manitowoc County, assigned me to be responsible for the prosecution and to assist in the investigation of this particular case. You have already heard that the reason for that was something called a perceived conflict, an apparent conflict. That is, it may look bad if Manitowoc County remained involved. You're going to hear evidence from many law enforcement officers. In fact, the lead investigators in this case, that there was no actual conflict. There was nothing that prohibited or precluded or le legally made it impossible for Manitowoc County to keep performing or keep assisting in this case but we all felt it better. Myself, Mr. Rohr, the two district attorneys, Sheriff Pago, and the law enforcement officials from Manitowoc that the case be transferred over to Calumet County and to DCI, the Division of Criminal Investigation, with the state to lead up the investigation. Now, you're going to hear that Manitowoc County officials remained involved in the case. They remained involved in the investigation that when manpower, and we are going to be talking about how many police officers were necessary, that they remain in a helping or a support role. But the case is, in fact, turned over to Calumet County. This particular photograph, I want you to look at for quite a bit of time as I'm talking. This is the Avery Salvage Yard, located in the town of Gibson. This is a photo that you're going to see a lot during the course of this case. And this is, for the next six weeks, a property that you're going to come to know very, very well. And so, as Mr. Fallon and Mr. Gon and I were talking about this opening statement, we thought it appropriate that we introduce you to the Avery Salvage property. First of all, it's a 40-acre property. The entire square here is 40 acres. What you also need to understand is that all of these appear to be little dots are cars. These are all junked vehicles in the Avery Salvage property. And a number that you are going to hear is that there are about 4,000 junk vehicles on the Avery Salvage property. There's four residences, four places where people live on the Avery Salvage property. The first 
in the lower left hand corner, which is the northwest corner of the property, is Stephen Avery's trailer. That's where Stephen Avery lived on the 31st of October. Living next to Stephen was his sister, Barb Yonda. Barb had four sons that were living with her at the time. But when you kind of look at this property, it's important to know where Barb Yonda's trailer is. Stephen's parents, Alan and Dolores Avery, also had a trailer, had a residence on the property. And that was up close to what you will find out are some business buildings. The salvage business itself was kind of up in this quadrant or this corner of the yard. And finally, Stephen's brother, Charles Avery, Chuck, also had a trailer on the property. All right. Now, you're going to hear that surrounding this property on three sides was an active working gravel quarry. And so we're going to have some larger aerial photos that we're going to show you in just a minute. But just to give you an idea of what's around this property, not just the 40 acres of search area, but hundreds of acres that surrounded that that were also included in the search. Members of the jury, the evidence is going to show you, show, and you're going to hear from officers when they talk about the search efforts in this case, that a search area this size is nothing short of overwhelming. All right? All of the places that the officers can look is absolutely overwhelming. If you know anything about the case, you will understand this event. But on Saturday, the 5th of November, Pam and Nicole Sturm, two citizens, two citizen searchers were given permission and did search the Avery salvage property. Pam and Nicole found the needle in the haystack. Pam and Nicole's term found the one vehicle on the property that all of the citizen searchers that you're going to hear about were looking for. Now, there are several things that the evidence is going to show and as you look at this photograph, several things about the attempts at whoever placed this vehicle here to disguise it, to hide it, attempts to obscure its detection, you're going to learn, members of the jury, through this evidence in the case, that the vehicle was locked, that the four doors on this vehicle were locked when Pam and Nicole came upon it. You're going to learn that the license plates were both removed. Both the front and back license plates were removed from the vehicle. You're going to learn the battery was disconnected. And you're also going to learn that the vehicle identification number was necessary to, in fact, identify this as Teresa Hawbach's vehicle. Now, the evidence is also going to show you where on the property Teresa Halbach's vehicle was found. It was found in, not accidentally, the furthest point from the defendant's trailer. Again, you're going to find that it was intentionally obscured, that it had immediate access to something called a car crusher on the property. And again, just to orient you, Stephen Avery's trailer is in the lower left-hand portion of this particular photograph. Where it was found is not an accident. We'll also tell you, during the course of the introduction of the testimony, that it's important where it wasn't found. It wasn't found on a roadway, wasn't found in some mall parking lot. It was found on the Avery salvage property the family business property. I talked about the car crusher. You will hear a little bit about that piece of equipment that was near or right next to Teresa Hawbach's vehicle. You're going to learn and you're going to hear evidence sometime through this six weeks how this piece of equipment works, how a regular looking vehicle, car, 
SUV, truck, starts out looking like a regular vehicle and ends up flattened or smashed. You're going to learn why it's important that Teresa's vehicle was next to the car crusher and you're going to learn the number of crushed vehicles and how easily Teresa Habach's vehicle could never have been found in this case. Could have been slipped in between, if you will, one of those other cars. You will hear about a lot of professionals that were asked to perform assistance in this case. You're going to hear about law enforcement professionals. You are going to hear about crime lab and an analysts. You're going to hear about some very, very well-qualified expert witnesses. And all of those professionals have two legs. One of them, though, has four. It's a Belgian shepherd named Brutus. Brutus is a search and rescue, or a search and recovery dog, that is, insensitively called a cadaver dog. What Brutus does is one thing. Brutus is highly trained. And you're going to hear testimony from Brutus's handler, Julie Kramer. Brutus does one thing, and that's find where a deceased person has been. The first official, first professional, to approach, approach this vehicle after it's found after law enforcement secures that area so nobody else can get around there, the first professional was a four-legged variety. It was Brutus. It was a canine. And Brutus, you're going to hear, was asked, not directed toward this vehicle, but asked just to search around this particular location. You're going to hear evidence that late in the afternoon on the 5th, after the vehicle was found, after a search warrant was already obtained in this case, that Brutus, when approaching Teresa Hobbock's vehicle, alerted. It's called hitting on the vehicle. It was quite a dramatic alert. And you're going to hear from Ms. Kramer about that. Sadly and unfortunately, that meant one thing to the handler. And that meant one thing to the lead investigators in this case. Early on, they suspected, because of Brutus, because of this search and rescue dog, because of this cadaver dog, that a deceased individual either was in the back of this SUV or at some point had been in the back of that SUV. Now, importantly, you are also going to hear that the police decided not to touch the vehicle at that time. The police decided not to process it, even when the crime lab was on the scene. You're going to hear that the crime lab loaded this vehicle onto an enclosed trailer, trucked the enclosed and intact SUV all the way to Madison where on a Sunday, for a very brief amount of time, but mostly on Monday, that vehicle was processed by the experts, processed by those state agents, by those state crime lab expert employees, analysts, when they made some very dramatic and very important findings in the case. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. Because on November 5th, on that first night, on that first afternoon, there were places to look, as you can imagine. After Teresa Hobbock's vehicle was found on the Avery Salvage property, Mr. Weekert, Mr. Fassbender, directing many law enforcement officials, had a job to do. Now, you saw the size of the Avery Salvage property you're going to hear testimony from Mr. Fassbender. He's going to provide you with an idea about the methodology, about the plan, the search plan in this case. You're going to hear 
Agent Fassbender talk about missing persons investigations and when they go from missing persons to criminal investigations, how their thought process changes. But at that early stage, when they find the vehicle, when they don't know that there is any blood in the back of the vehicle, when they don't know if a body is involved in this case, that Agent Fassbender and every other law enforcement officer you will hear at that scene had one thing in mind, and that was to find Teresa. The job of the police at that time was to find Karen Halbach's daughter. And you're going to hear the evidence that the officers made very, very quick work of searching all of the residents on the Avery Savage property, all of the four residences, all of the outbuildings. They are searching for Teresa Halbach, and the search plan, again, is to find the victim, find the victim's body. But a secondary obligation of theirs is also to look for obvious signs of evidence, right? You don't have to watch CSI to know that. At least a first kind of sweep, or a first kind of look through, or first kind of search of all these residences, residences are to try to find obvious signs of a crime if, in fact, a crime did occur, or something that is going to help law enforcement find Teresa Halbach. Why I say all that is because Stephen Avery, with search warrant in hand, Stephen Avery's residence was searched on the 5th. Now, again, we're looking for Teresa's body, hopefully alive, but if not, it is important to find if she's on that property. Stephen Avery's garage is searched, other residences, all of the other buildings on the residence are searched, the salvage business itself, but the 4,000 vehicles and what you will hear was a torrential downpour, were also examined for the first time on the evening of the 5th. Now, law enforcement officers were involved in that, but Brutus's friends were also involved in that. Other canines, the rest of the team, the other search and rescue animals, the canines were taken in a downpour in the pitch dark out on a 40-acre property. And every one of these cars was encircled by one of those dogs trying to find Teresa Halbach. Please recall at this early stage, the police don't know what they're looking for yet. They don't really have an idea yet of the kinds of things that they were looking for. So when you remember this search plan, you will hear evidence of some officers may even call it the funnel approach. Nothing fancy about calling it the funnel approach. It makes sense. It's a way to describe search efforts. It's actually an interviewing technique as well. But it's a way to find evidence in a funnel type of approach. We're looking for the body first. Then we're looking for obvious signs of evidence. Then as you get closer and closer into more detail, more thorough, more directed searches because you're able to go back into all of those places and all of those properties. That's the methodology. And as you hear officers testify throughout this case, when they testify on the witness stand, remember that funnel approach. Remember that kind of methodology as they talk about these kinds of things. But make no mistake that on the first night, they are looking for Teresa, and they are hoping to find Teresa alive. When that was unsuccessful, the next morning, on the 6th, Mr. Fassbender, Mr. Weekert were able to secure some help. They needed bodies. They needed some cops. They needed some volunteers. And so they got volunteer firefighters from all over the Manitowoc and Calumet County areas. And they all showed up in force, in mass, 
on the morning of Sunday, November 6. And for the first time, every one of those 4,000 vehicles was opened up. Every one of those 4,000 trunks was opened by a firefighter with a police officer with them looking for the body of Teresa Hobbock. Also on Sunday, November 6, a firearm was found, or recovered. It was actually found the evening before, but it was seized. It was recovered. It was hanging over the bed of the defendant, Stephen Avery. He thought it was appropriate to recover that as a piece of evidence, and in fact, it was. You're going to hear that the brand name of this semi-automatic 22 caliber rifle is Marlin. You're going to hear that it is something called the tube loaded. Not that any of these things are going to mean much to you at this point, but there are a number of bullets that are able to be loaded into this semi-automatic rifle. You are going to hear, by the way, Although hanging over Mr. Avery's bed and his exercising control over that should be obvious that on the 31st of October, Mr. Avery exercised a great deal more control. A deserving piece of evidence was seized on the Sunday, the 6th of November, and it is what we believe the last recorded voice of 25-year-old Teresa Hoppe. When Mr. Avery, the evidence will show, made arrangements to have this young woman come out to his property that afternoon, he didn't use his own name. He didn't use the name Stephen Avery, even though Ms. Hoppe had been out to the property, as I told you, on a number of occasions before, Mr. Avery used a different person's name. He used the name B. Yonda, the initial B. Yonda, J-A-N-D-A. That's Barb Yonda, can be Barb Yonda. But when we call the Auto Trader Magazine people in Milwaukee, and you're going to hear from Ms. Schuster and Ms. Pliska, two employees of Auto Trader, Mr. Avery used the name and used the number or B. Yonda. Teresa Hobbock doesn't know who B. Yonda is. You're going to hear her evidence that Ms. Hobbock called back the telephone number for Barb Yonda and she left this voicemail. This voicemail was recovered, was retrieved. You're going to hear this voicemail and you're going to hear from Teresa in her own words in this courtroom that she got the message that she knows that you want me to come out to the property. Teresa Hobbock tells Bianca that she's going to be out there sometime after 2 p.m. that very day on the 31st of October. This will be important for you in determining a timeline. Where was Teresa all that day? Was this before or after she went to Schmidt's photo shoot? and the zipper her photo shoot. That's going to be uncontroverted. Absolutely. This is the last stop that she made on the 31st of October. Two days into this, folks, we're now on Monday, the 7th of November, and the first results come from the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory. The first results find several things. First of all, in the back cargo area of Teresa's SUV, they find that there's female blood. They find there is a lot of female blood in the back of Teresa's SUV. But they also found, interestingly, male blood. At least at that early stage with their early typing, they could find that it was male blood. And interestingly, and importantly, that already on Monday, the 7th of November, there is male blood found in the victim's vehicle in at least six different locations. Six different places they find male blood. Mr. Weaker, Mr. Fassbender, 
All of the investigators don't understand the significance of the male blood being in six different places. They do, however, <clears throat> understand the significance of a lot of female blood. And they suspect early on that something horrible has come to Teresa Albach. Also on Monday, a burn barrel was discovered. Not just any burn barrel. Again, here's a picture, an overview, a part of the aerial photograph of the Avery property itself. There is Stephen Avery's trailer, and located outside of Stephen Avery's trailer was a burn barrel that was recovered. Now, again, not just any burn barrel, but Stephen Avery's burn barrel. And you will, late, you will hear later in my opening, and you will hear a lot of evidence about the trial, about what critical pieces of information were found from that burn barrel. But put it in perspective, on Monday, that was found. I provide this slide just as another example for you of where that burn barrel was in relationship, not only to the proximity of Stephen Avery's trailer, but the proximity to this red Dodge Caravan. You may also have guessed, this is the car that Stephen Avery asked Teresa Hobbock to come take a picture of. All right, so the proximity of the burn barrel to his front door and also to the Dodge Caravan will be important in the determination at the close of this case when you decide who was responsible for these crimes. The next day, three critical pieces of evidence are found on Tuesday the 8th. Now, we talked about these more detailed searches. On Tuesday, one of these more detailed searches occurred in Mr. Avery's trailer. You're going to hear evidence that this bookcase was pulled out, was jostled about. You're going to hear evidence about this particular binder having been pulled out of the bookcase. And after the officers looked through it, how it was slammed back in as the bookcase was actually pulled out from the wall. And after jostling and after searching it, after slamming things in around and after putting the bookcase back in its location, you're going to hear that is what the officers saw. They saw a Toyota vehicle key in the bedroom of Mr. Avery. You're going to hear evidence that it had obvious evidentiary value, that the officers at that time stopped what they were doing. An investigator Dan Kaharski of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department seized or took control of that key during that more detailed search. More detailed searches were also occurring at the same time of the entire Avery Salvage Yard, which included now officers, volunteer firefighters, going through all of the cars again. 4,000 searches occurred again on Tuesday. But you're going to hear this time they weren't looking for a body. At this time, they were looking for stuff. They were looking for evidence. After the body wasn't found in their first search, they are going back and they are looking for items of obvious evidentiary value. You're going to hear testimony they found something of obvious evidentiary value. They found the victim, Teresa Habach's license plates crumpled up in a station wagon. I just show you this slide to show you what the vehicle looked like, the station wagon that the license plates were found in, and also provide this aerial photograph to give you an idea of the vehicle that the license plates were found in. Very quickly, I want to remind you of Stephen Avery's trailer is down in the lower left-hand corner, that the access road leading to Mr. Avery's trailer comes from the top of this figure down towards the right. Teresa Havoc's vehicle is found in the first vehicle next to the access road on its way to Stephen Avery's trailer. 
Again, the evidence is going to show, not by accident, the proximity to the defendant's roadway, the proximity to the defendant's trailer, all becoming important. Now, I told you that there were three important discoveries on the A. And the third and perhaps the most important discovery that day is something that's being referred to as a burn area. Again, just to orient you, it's the same kind of picture that we have been looking at. Stephen Avery's trailer, Stephen Avery's garage, the Dodge Caravan, the van that Ms. Havok was taking pictures of, was located right there. And there's the burn area. The proximity of this burn area to the garage is obvious. The proximity of this burn area to Mr. Avery's trailer itself is obvious. To provide you with another view of this burn area, again located, you can see his trailer, you can see the garage on the right. But importantly, that burn area contained human remains. It contained obvious bone fragments. Even to the untrained officers that stumbled upon this particular burn area, even when they called over the crime lab to process this particular location, it was obvious that there were human remains in this particular burn area. Now, this next picture is particularly important because it was taken before any processing begins. There's the burn area that we're talking about. That's the burn area that contained the obvious human remains. You will see and you will hear from the officers who were at the scene that this burn area from the first night was guarded, was guarded by Mr. Avery's German Shepherd. I believe his name was Bear. But this particular German Shepherd, not of the friendly sort, did not allow law enforcement officers to get close to this burn area. Did not allow any of the canine help that was out there to get close to that area. And any time, excuse me, law enforcement even got close to the burn area, Bear made sure that they were shooed away. But I think it's also important about this case, when we talk about proximity, there isn't any question who exercises control over this burn area. And in the background, just, just see how close it is to that van that Teresa Hobbock was asked to take a picture of. The next day, Wednesday, November 9th, was the first time that recovered bone fragments from that burn area are identified by an anthropologist. An anthropologist is a professional who looks at bones and can identify whether they are human or that they are non-human, where they go. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But even though these fragments are small, even though they are burned, burned almost beyond recognition on Wednesday the 9th, they determined that those were, in fact, adult female remains found right behind the defendant's garage. All right? This is the first image that is not a photograph that I'm showing you. This is computer generated. We're going to hear from a man who created these images. His name is Tim Austin. He works for the State Patrol, the state of Wisconsin, in scene reconstruction. And what Tim Austin will tell you is that he was out at the scene, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but he was out at the scene and took over 4,100 measurements out at the scene. And after taking his own photographs, and after taking 4,100 images, excuse me, measurements, he was able to recreate some of these scenes for you, for the jury. And these are created for the jury so that you can see things that the naked eye can't see. 
so that you can see things that photographs can't show, so that you can see relationships <clears throat> between some evidence and fixed objects and other evidence is found. And so as you see this perspective, you will see that you are up, you know, dozens of feet above the ground. And it's something, again, unless you are that tall, you're not going to be able to see this kind of location. But this particular computer generated animation is important to embrace or to, for a jury to look at in the case because the burn area is clearly visible. How close it is to Mr. Avery's garage, how close it is to the trailer, how close it is to the other area, what's called the curtilage. That is the area that surrounds Mr. Avery's property. All becomes important. All right, so these are, and when something is not a picture, when it in fact was created through computer animation or computer generation, I will let you know that. One of the bones that was recovered was a long bone. And I'm showing you this for a reason in my opening statement so that you understand what you're looking at here. That we aren't just looking at some bone in abstract. We're not just looking at some DNA profile. It's Teresa Halbach's shin bone, all right? It's Karen Halbach's daughter's tibia. And attached to Teresa Halbach's tibia was some tissue. Now, despite Mr. Avery, the evidence will show that despite Mr. Avery's efforts to completely obliterate all these bones by burning to incinerate these bones completely, this bone survived. This tissue that was on the bone survived, which allowed a DNA match, which allowed the state of Wisconsin analyst, guess who? Sherry Colhane. When she performed an analysis on that tissue to match it with the blood found in the back of the SUV, with a soda can, that is found in the front of the SUV and with a standard. Now, the standard is also called an exemplar. You are going to hear those two statements, but Teresa Halbach, before the 31st of October, had a pap smear performed, a cervical swab that was performed. And thankfully for us, that was kept at Bellin up in Green Bay well, Sherry, also Ms. Colhane, also was able to develop a DNA profile from the pap smear. We know that's Teresa. And from that exemplar, from that example, matches the tissue on the leg bone, matches the blood, matches the soda can. We can say with 100% certainty that those human remains are those of Teresa Habak. The first 11 days of this case became extremely important. And for just about five minutes here, I want to give you those 11 days in. And what you have just heard, that part of the investigation, you have only heard 11 days worth of investigation, which has gone on 15 months now. But the first 11 days are important, and I want to just run through those for you. Ms. Habach is killed on the 31st of October. At the Stephen Avery Savage property, sometime after 2.45 p.m., you are going to hear from a gentleman by the name of Tom Pierce, who is Teresa Habach's business partner that she doesn't show up for work on the first or second. And on the third, Teresa Halbach is reported missing to law enforcement authorities. That's when the missing person's investigation from a law enforcement standpoint begins. I think, if you will, as to the feelings of the Halbach family and friends and how worried they are even on the third. But 
On the fourth, you're going to hear from a witness named Ryan Hillegas, who helped coordinate the citizen search efforts. You're going to hear that there was something called cell tracking. We're going to hear a little bit about that. A cell phone actually is almost a transmitting device and it pings or beeps, if you will, off of cell towers all over the state whenever you carry it in your pocket, whether it's on or not. You are going to hear evidence about attempts to find Teresa's cell phone. If we find her cell phone, we can find Teresa. We also looked at those early stages for whether or not she's used any of her credit cards. Where is Teresa Haubach? We try to find out. You're going to hear that a gentleman by the name of Kurt Drum, a pilot in the Manitowoc area, volunteered his airplane and helped law enforcement fly over Mr. Zipper's residence and Mr. Schmidt's residence and the Avery compound and any of the roads that may have led to and from there to try and find Teresa Haubach. On the 5th, we know that Teresa's vehicle was found at the Avery Salvage property. You will hear that search warrants were obtained. You will hear during the course of this case that a search warrant is nothing more than a piece of paper. It's a judicial authorization. A judge authorizes law enforcement officers to search the property in private areas. And we got many, many search warrants in this case and searched for her body. You have heard already that on the 6th, firearms are obtained or taken from Mr. Avery's bedroom. His garage is searched, at least the first search of the garage for those items of obvious evidentiary value. But remember, on that Sunday, we don't have any results yet from the crime lab. Those don't come in until sometime on Monday, when the crime lab determines that both male and female blood is located in the SUV. We search, for the first time, all of the junk vehicles. At least all of the trunks are searched and Mr. Avery's burn barrel is discovered and searched. And other things will happen, and you are going to hear from other officers that the surrounding areas, not just the 40 acres, but hundreds of acres of gravel pits and the like, are being searched in these early days. On Tuesday, perhaps the most important of all the days as far as discoveries go, those three critical discoveries are made. The Toyota key, the license plates, and the burn area behind the defendant's property. On Wednesday the 9th, there is an identification made of male blood in the victim's vehicle. That blood matches the DNA profile of the defendant, Stephen Avery and bones are recovered and determined to be that of an adult female. You will hear on the 10th on Thursday, the burn area is further excavated by arson investigators and other crime lab and other types of officials. But interestingly, the defendant's DNA is now found on the key. And finally, on Friday the 11th, the female blood that was found, the great pool, if you will, of female blood in the cargo area is now matched. It is determined to match the soda can, the saliva from the diet wild cherry Pepsi, I believe, soda can in the front of Teresa's car. The blood is now presumed to be that of the victim, Teresa Havok. You have heard that the term that they told me there would be no math. Well, there's going to be some science. And here's where I have to at least give you an overview of what the science is going to be. The science, the blood part of the science, the DNA analysis and explanation of this case is going to come from this gentleman right here. 
Norm Gunn. Mr. Gunn, you will learn by his examination, is quite knowledgeable in DNA and DNA from a prosecution standpoint. And in all honesty and in all candor, that's why he was added to the prosecution team. Because this is such an important part of the case. The science becomes very, very important. You're going to hear about a DNA analyst from the Wisconsin Crime Lab named Sherry Colhane. Again, Ms. Colhane, almost unbelievably, is the very analyst that exonerates Mr. Stephen Avery several years earlier. She's the same analyst that does the detailed DNA work on Mr. Avery's work with the Innocence Project and frees Mr. Avery from his incarceration. Well, that same woman, Sherry Colhane, processes this vehicle because she's the unit head, because this is such an important case, she does the work herself. She does all of the analysis of all the blood that's found in these cases. You're gonna hear from Ms. Colhane through the assistance of Mr. Gunn what DNA is, that it is a genetic fingerprint, if you will, provides an opportunity, as most of you may already know, to take a sample and to take an unknown sample, something like blood that's found in the back of an SUV, and to take a known DNA sample, since our DNA is all the same in all of our bodily fluids. Our blood has the same DNA as our saliva, as our semen, as the skin cell, as our tissue, it's all the same DNA. So once you develop a profile, each of us all has different DNA. It's unique to each of us. And Mr. Gunn will explain all of that for you. But with that as the background, Ms. Colhane was able to establish all of the places in that SUV that had Teresa Halbach's DNA. You're going to learn that they found a large quantity of the blood and DNA in the cargo floor and the side panel. The back cargo door, you are going to hear that there were splatters, spatters, of Teresa Halbach's blood in the back cargo door. You're going to hear that on the rear tailgate, there were droplets of Teresa's blood. Her DNA is found on the door handle and also, as I have already alluded and you might expect, the saliva from the soda can, Ms. Colhane will find DNA evidence. I told you about male blood that was in the SUV. On Wednesday, the 9th of November, Stephen Avery subjected to a very thorough medical examination, again, as a result of a warrant, as a result of a judicial authorization to do that particular kind of examination. And what they found was a very, very deep cut to Mr. Avery's right middle finger, but importantly, on the outside of his right middle finger. And that's where the cut was. This cut was actively bleeding on the 31st of October. And I guess thankfully for the state. And as a jury, I hope at the conclusion of this case, you will say thankfully for you because DNA analysis was then possible because of his actively bleeding, of his leaving his DNA behind inside of Teresa's vehicle. Ms. Colhane will tell you that the defendant's blood was found in at least six places in Teresa Halbach's SUV including the rear passenger door, smeared or wiped on the rear passenger door. Okay, there's a front door, there's a back door, kind of like a four-door car. It was in the back door and it's along the edge or along the metal of the rear passenger door. That's Stephen Avery's blood. That's how much blood he left on the side of the door. We've heard about the defendant's blood on the ignition That positively matched that of Stephen Avery. As you think about this case and 
I will argue at the end of the case, but there isn't any secret, and the defense understands this as well, an actively bleeding middle right finger. And when you look at the, <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at the smear, kind of visual, visualize turning the ignition and how that can smear from the outside of the middle finger and leave that particular kind of a DNA evidence. Other places that the defendant bled inside of the victim's car included blood on her CD case in her front seat. Both front seats had droplets of Mr. Avery's blood on it. The rear tailgate, remember I told you there was a droplet of Teresa's blood? Because Mr. Avery is actively bleeding, there is a droplet of his blood as well. And also on the front console floor, is kind of up in that particular area. Sherry Colhane and Mr. Gon are better able to explain all those for you, but it's important for you to know. Now, again, the jigsaw puzzle. When you hear the evidence and when you have to decide who killed Teresa Hava, this evidence points to one person. Now, Mr. Gon and his questioning and Ms. Colhane is going to tell you that DNA evidence, again, is not just from blood. It can be from skin cells, which are left through perspiration, sweat, okay? Saliva and sweat and all those other kinds of bodily fluids that we talked about. So when somebody's hands are sweating and you handle something, it's possible that you can leave your DNA on that thing that you handled. You've heard a suggestion already in which there will be evidence in this case that the battery was disconnected on Ms. Halbach's vehicle. We'll tell you, or at least we'll argue, as to why that happened. But importantly, in reaching up underneath the hood to open up Teresa Halbach's vehicle, Mr. Avery was kind enough to leave his DNA on the hood latch. Okay, that will come from Sherry Colhane as well. In handling Ms. Halbach's key that starts the ignition and putting it into his bedroom, Mr. Avery was kind enough to leave his DNA on that portion of the Toyota key that was found. So that's part of the science. Other science is going to include things like teeth. Teeth that were recovered from the burn area. This part of the science, by the way, will be handled by Mr. Fallon and other expert witnesses, but most importantly, through somebody called a forensic odontologist. That's a big word. Kind of scared me when I first heard it. Gentleman's name is Dr. Donald Simley. Mr. Simley is an odontologist. From a forensic standpoint, it's kind of a dentist who matches stuff up. So Mr. or Dr. Simley, the dentist, the odontologist, will show you a, what's called a panorex x-ray. We went to Teresa's dentist. We got her x-rays from when she had work being done, and Dr. Simley will show you tooth number 31 which is the second last two in the bottom left jaw. Dr. Simley will also tell you that x-rays were taken of teeth that were found from the burn area. He will show you tooth number 31 that was actually recovered from the burn area and will allow the jury to make their own comparisons. We talked about an anthropologist. Our anthropologist is Dr. Leslie Eisenberg. Dr. Eisenberg will tell you about her credentials, about how she does this, this whole kind of work. And although, unfortunately, the bones that she had to deal with, and again, we aren't talking about a full skeleton that was found in that, that bone pit. If we did, by the way, we may not be including a charge against Mr. Avery for mutilation of a corpse. 
But mutilation of this little girl, excuse me, not this little girl, but this young woman absolutely occurred. Because this is what's left, small, tiny pieces of bone fragment. And when you talk about a jigsaw puzzle, when you talk about trying to put all of this together, it's a very, very difficult process. And when I asked, and the testimony actually of Dr. Eisenberg is going to allude to this jigsaw puzzle kind of analogy, and we don't even have a box or a cover to go on. Luckily for us and luckily for you, Leslie Eisenberg is your jigsaw puzzle covered box. In other words, Dr. Eisenberg knows where every one of these bones go. Dr. Eisenberg will identify all of these bone fragments. She'll identify from a female skeleton and from examples that are used, all of the different parts of Teresa that were found. Okay, okay. And it will help you as far as identification processes go as to what parts of Teresa's bones and what parts of the body were actually recovered in this case. Now, not all evidence is of equal weight and two really important pieces of bone were found and those were two pieces of what are called the cranium, the skull, that were burned very, very badly, but were identified as such by Dr. Eisenberg. The parts of the skull, this picture that you are looking at, is actually a part of the skull now. This brilliant woman is going to tell you that this isn't just part of the skull, but this is a little piece of the skull that's just on top of or over somebody's left ear. How do you tell that kind of thing looking at a bone like that? But that's what an anthropologist apparently, apparently does. And that's why she's an expert and we're not in this area. But importantly, the damage, the defect that's caused the evidence is going to show you that you are looking at the inside, from the inside out, the inside of Teresa's skull out, that the circular or half circle, because this isn't the full piece, this is half of the important piece here, is extremely important. The defect, the damage here, the testimony will be is caused by a high velocity projectile. We take this same bone fragment and you are going to hear evidence about other experts and it allows some other analysis of this particular piece of bone, this particular piece of cranium. You are going to hear from a gentleman by the name of Ken Olson from the crime lab. He is an expert in trace evidence the CSI kind of stuff, but the trace from an elemental standpoint. When you x-ray something, the evidence is going to show bone and other kinds of vascular or veins and things show up after you x-ray even a burned piece of bone. But what also shows up are things that don't burn up, all right? When Mr. Olson testifies, he's going to point to these little bright dots that are right on the lip of the cranial defect. Those little bright dots, he's going to say he examined. He recovered those and he did his analysis on them, elemental analysis, and found that they are lead. These little dots are lead, what's called lead spray. You're going to hear testimony that there's only one thing, only one item that can travel fast enough as a projectile to cause this kind of a defect and also leave lead. And as you might predict, that's a bullet, all right? Lead spray is left by bullets. 
Dr. Eisenberg then, with the assistance of a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey Jensen, is the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner. Dr. Jensen has, and you will hear, he has a great deal of experience nationally, a national expert in things like gunshot wounds. Dr. Jensen and Dr. Eisenberg will render two expert opinions. First of all, that the left parietal region, the region just above the left ear, the thing that you just saw, the combination of the projectile and the lead spray leads these two experts, and especially the pathologist, especially Dr. Jensen, who will tell you that that's an entrance wound just above the left ear of Teresa Habach. They will also find a second, and we will show you a second entrance wound. Similar kind of defect that's found in a recovered bone that is on what's called the occipital region of the skull. That's to the back and just to the left side of the back of the skull. And that was a second entrance wound. Finally, their opinion when they put together, when you ask of the state, what was the cause of death? What was the mechanism of death? At the conclusion of this case, I will be able to tell you, this was a homicide, and it included at least two gunshot wounds to the head of 25-year-old Teresa Habach. I'm almost done, so hang on. Remember this burn barrel? Remember, found outside of Mr. Avery's trailer? Well, this burn barrel, as I told you, was examined. And although Mr. Avery, the evidence will show you, attempted to burn up all of the stuff that was in the burn barrel, it didn't burn. It didn't burn up. And the things that didn't burn up were electronic components. All of these electronic components were found in Mr. Avery's burn barrel. This is other evidence. This is more evidence. Not just the science. Not just the DNA. Not just the blood. But at the conclusion of the case, will be other evidence that will be able to assist you in pointing to who killed Teresa Halbach. Of those electronic components included Teresa's cell phone. You will hear evidence that Teresa had a Motorola V3 Razor cell phone. And when we look at and when the experts show you those electronic components that are found within the burn barrel, you will recognize, or some of you might, the Motorola sign. But for those of you that don't, we're gonna have a gentleman by the name of Mr. Thomas from the FBI come here from Virginia, and he's gonna show you all those components, and he's gonna show you what they looked like when they were recovered from Mr. Avery's burn barrel and what they used to look like on a Mo Motorola V3 Razor cell phone. All right, so you are going to be able to match up the components itself and what it used to look like before Mr. Avery's attempts to destroy that evidence as well. You're gonna hear about a digital camera that Teresa Halbach had, digital camera that she used to take pictures was a Canon A310, PowerShot A310. You are going to hear all kinds of interesting evidence about how a digital camera, and some of you may know this, and certainly our media friends know this, but when you take a picture with a digital camera, that photo, that image that you take with a digital camera leaves a signature. It leaves an electronic imprint on the image itself. And so 
If you put that picture on a laptop computer or your home computer and you take your little mouse and put what's called the cursor, the little arrow thing over the picture itself, it gives you an incredible amount of information. It gives you the date that that picture was taken. It tells you things about the picture itself, including what kind of camera was used. And you are going to learn, and you are going to see at least six different pictures that were taken at Stephen Avery's property by Teresa Hoppe. And all six of those include that little imprint, include that signature, will tell you conclusively that Teresa uses the Canon PowerShot A310. All right? We'll have these even more blown up for you but that says PowerShot A310. There isn't going to be any question at all about whose camera it was that Mr. Avery burned in his burn barrel on the 31st of October. You are going to hear about those other electronic components, by the way. I don't know if you plan to use a Palm Pilot or a PDA, a personal data assistant, Teresa had one of those that was also burned up and found in that burn barrel with some other information. But when on the topic of what other evidence, what additional evidence, we're not done there, folks. All right? We have other evidence that we have developed in the last 15 months. You're going to learn that in Mr. Avery's garage, after shooting the bullets into 25-year-old Teresa Havok, they ejected what are called shell casings. Those are the little brass casings that come out of a gun after you shoot the gun. Well, it's possible for experts, for tool mark experts from the crime lab, to match up those shell casings with a specific gun. And they will, in fact match that 22 caliber rifle that's hanging over Mr. Avery's bed. Now, March 1st and 2nd, two bullets were found, also in Mr. Avery's garage. Through a more detailed search, you will find out why that happened. Through a more detailed search of the garage, two bullet fragments were found in Avery's garage, one of those bullet fragments, after going through Teresa Halbach, included Teresa's DNA. And so as a matter, through Mr. Gong and through his experts, you will learn that Teresa helped you too, that she left behind some evidence for you to consider in this case. Teresa left behind her DNA for you to consider on one of the bullets that's found in the defendant, Mr. Avery's garage. You will hear about things like phone calls. You'll hear about how phone calls can't be changed in the records, and we can provide a timeline as to when certain things happened. When Mr. Avery called for Teresa, when he called her two times before she ever got there, and when he places uh, what we're going to be called an alibi call two hours after she's already at the property, you're going to hear about all those kinds of phone calls. And as I mentioned, at least briefly, before other analysis of bone and tissue, other things to point to, if in fact the state even questioned whose bones and whose tissue it is behind Mr. Avery's property. Lastly, I just want to remind you of the kind of exhibits that you're going to hear in this case. You are going to see items that were seized, stuff that was seized from the scene from Mr. Avery's property. You're going to get photographs from out of the scene but you are also going to see photographs after the evidence was already obtained so that you have a more pristine or a better view of some of this evidence. 
You're going to look at documents and records. You're going to hear from experts. And they will provide some written expert reports and also summary and demonstrative exhibits. Just a little bit on summary exhibits. When there's lots of evidence like documents, lots of things in documents, phone records, you know, things like this. When it's hard for you to digest, we'll try to create a one or a two page summary of all that information to help the jury and find out exactly what all of it means. And finally, audio and videotaped kinds of evidence. You would expect to find those kinds of things. Remember I told you before, just talking about different kinds of photos, about those pictures that Teresa took, those six different pictures, this is one of them. It was taken on June 20th by Teresa Haubach. I use this as an example because, because I wanted to. But it shows very clearly Mr. Avery's trailer, his garage. It's clear through Auto Trader Magazine when Mr. Avery in June of this year tried to sell this particular trailer. Teresa Havok took this picture again with a Canon PowerShot A310. You will, you will hear all those kinds of things. But the reason, at least for this part of the presentation, I'm showing you this, is it tells you a difference between a scene photo and things that I mentioned, at least briefly before, computer-generated scene models. Again, this isn't a picture. This is uh, provided by Mr. Austin, but you will note that it's something that you couldn't see with your eye. Again, Usually there's elevations that are involved. These kinds of models are, by the way, within an inch, you will hear, accurate. Every measurement is within an inch. So this isn't some blackboard that was taken down and you just do the best you can. And these are 4,100 measurements that make everything geometrically perfect geometrically accurate to within an inch. But these kinds of models should assist you. Since it's the middle of February, we're not going to be traipsing off to the Avery property. These kinds of things may help you in understanding better and getting a better tour of the Avery property. But just this model, as an example, shows you how close Mr. Avery's burn barrel is to his front door how close it is to the vehicle that Ms. Halbach took pictures of, and even things like, after taking the pictures, the path that Teresa Halbach took as she walked towards Mr. Avery's property. For those of you big picture people, not detail-oriented people, you all were asked that question. We'll have aerial photographs for you, again, when we look at all of the surrounding gravel pits on at least three sides of the Avery property and how that may fit into some of those kinds of things. We have interior photos as well. Photos of the inside of Mr. Avery's garage. Now, you will note a couple of things about this photo. First of all, you will note how cluttered, to say the least, that it is. And this might help you understand how difficult it was for officers, not knowing what they're looking for in November, to kind of go through this garage, not knowing that the shooting, not knowing that the shooting happened in this garage. The officers didn't really know what they were looking for. But in March, when this picture was taken, and they know what they're looking for, and they know where to look in the garage, these kind of pictures should be able to help you. But Mr. Austin also will help you in giving you a geometric perspective, ripping the roof off, if you will, of the garage and show you models of the insides of the garage. By the way, just so there isn't any question why I'm showing this you this exhibit, one of the bullets number nine, which was found in the crack of a, 
the cement that was not cleaned up in this case, and tent number 23A underneath what was an air compressor, the evidence is going to show is the bullet that Teresa left her DNA for you. Underneath that air compressor is where they recovered that second bullet. Other interior photos, you are going to see photos of the interior of Mr. Avery's bedroom, the gun rack that hangs over Mr. Avery's bed with two firearms. One was a 50 caliber, caliber muzzle loader, and on top of that was a 22 caliber automatic, semi-automatic rifle. But Mr. Austin again provides you with ripping off the roof, if you will, interior scene models, where you're going to be able to look at the living room of, of Mr. Avery and his spare bedroom and his bathroom and Mr. Avery's master bedroom be able to kind of walk around within that space. So it will help you understand where some of these evidence or some of this evidence was found. Finally, the kinds of witnesses that you're gonna hear from include citizens and law enforcement officers and records kinds of people, although most of those will be agreed to between Mr. Strang and us, as well as expert witnesses. You will hear from various kinds of citizens like Bobby Dassey, who is one of the sons of Barbianda, who you will hear testimony about, that at about 2.45 on the 31st of October, Bobby saw a young girl drive up to the Avery property. Bobby Dassey saw this young girl, later identified as Teresa Hobbock, get out of her teal or blue or green colored SUV and actually take pictures of the van that her mom had for sale. Bobby Dassey is going to tell you that after looking out the window and after seeing Teresa Halbach take these photographs of this vehicle and finish her job, that Teresa walked toward Stephen Avery's trailer. You will hear evidence that she was walking towards the main entrance of Stephen Avery's trailer and that Bobby thereafter took a shower and left to go deer hunting, bow hunting, about 15 minutes later. You're going to hear from Bobby that when he left 15 minutes later, Teresa's SUV was there, but Teresa was nowhere to be found. You are going to hear that Bobby Dassey was the last person, the last citizen that will have seen Teresa Havok alive. You're going to hear from other citizens like that, other people that will help place this case into context for us. Jurors are triers of fact. You don't decide what the law is, the judge does that. But you decide what the facts of the case are. And the facts in this case aren't just going to point to who did it. It's not just a who done it case. It's a what happened and where it happened and when it happened. But we're also going to provide you evidence not just that Stephen Avery did it, but to the exclusion of other people as well. In other words, positive evidence about who done know it, but also negative evidence of why that necessarily excludes others. And so you get to find those facts, and at the end of this case, you will search for the truth. You are not to search for doubt. You are to search for the truth. I told you when you started this case and when this opening statement started that this may in fact be the most important decision that you will ever going to make. That leaves us then with the end. I'm going to remind you through this case, I'm not going to apologize about it, but this is Teresa Havak. I'm not going to apologize about the fact that this is not a DNA profile number. This isn't a box of recovered bones. But as I have mentioned before, 
remembering the humanity of Teresa Habak, remembering who she is, what she meant to these people, is an important part of this process. Ultimately, this process includes assigning accountability. It will require you to assign responsibility for the murder and mutilation of an innocent 25-year-old young lady. I'm confident, members of the jury, that after the conclusion of this, what could in fact be a six-week trial, that you are going to agree with me. You're going to agree with the state that we have met our burden, that is, beyond a reasonable doubt. I will ask at the conclusion of this case that you return verdicts of guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Katz, members of the jury. It's quarter to twelve. It's a little earlier than we normally take a lunch break, but I don't believe there is time enough to get started with anything else before lunch. During the course of the trial, the court will attempt to give you a break every hour and a half or so because I realise that your attention is required and sitting for much longer than that can impair your attention. I do want to remind you at this time, as I will periodically... Ah, <laughs> oh, damn. Hey, I will need to go back. Hey, I do want to remind you at this time, as I will periodically... <laughs> oh, stop me now. I need to get that word. Is it periodically? Say it again. Periodic. Aye, peri peri periodic. periodically. 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 Is that how you say it? Periodically. Right, cool. I'll start it. I don't want. Periodically. Ah, that sounds right. I don't want to remind you at this time, as I periodically, throughout the trial, that are, you are not to begin with your deliberations and discussions of the case until all the evidence is presented. I instruct you on the law at the conclusion of the case. Do not discuss the case amongst yourselves, including the opening statement given today or with anyone else, until you begin your final deliberations in the jury, jury room. We'll take your lunch break now and resume at one o'clock. You may be seated. Council, in terms of the schedule for this afternoon, is the state going to have some evidence to present after the opening statement? All right. We'll see you back at one o'clock. Go ahead. All right. I did do a recall the statement in regarding the presumption of innocence that you referred to. And I do agree that the precise extemorphous statement for Mr. Kratz is not technically correct. I'm going to grant your request to repeat the presumption of and instruction before you give your opening. Other item about during the victim's lifetime, I think I covered that in the initial instructions. Again, I'm confident that six weeks from now, the jury will have forgotten any subtle distinction that may have taken place in the opening. But I will repeat the presumption of innocence instruction without giving any specific reason why. Because I doubt that the jury caught the significance of it, but it was technically incorrect. All right, anything else before we break? Members of the jury, a question came up during the break concerning the definition of presumption of innocence, so I am going to read that excerpt to you again at this time from the opening instructions I gave you earlier. Then we'll hear the opening statement from the defence. Defendants are not required to prove their innocence. The law presumes every person charged with the commission of an offence to be innocent. The presumption requires a finding of not guilty unless in deliberations you find it is overcome by evidence which satisfies you, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the defendant is guilty. Mr Strang, at this time, you may begin. Thank you, Your Honour. Good afternoon. This summer, it will be 22 years, 22 years since a woman running on the beach in Manitowoc was raped and beaten nearly to death. The Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department investigated those awful crimes and they charged Stephen Avery with rape and attempted murder 
on that Manitowoc beach 22 summers ago. He said consistently that he was innocent, that he had not done it. No one believed him. No one but his own family believed him. And as that case was making its way through the Manitowoc County Circuit Court, just one county over, Theresa Marie Holbeck was five and was starting kindergarten. Somewhere else, somewhere we don't know, a man named Gregory Allen, presumably, was laughing and planning his next violent rape. Eleven years later, in 1996, Stephen Avery was trying, still, to make people understand that he was innocent. DNA testing was in its infancy. It was beginning to move into courtrooms, out of scientific laboratories. But we have come a long way, just a few years since 1996, and it was not as advanced as it is today. In 1996, Stephen Avery took a chance and had blood drawn, a little vial of blood. It was sent off through the help of his lawyers for early DNA testing. It couldn't clear him entirely. It helped, but it did not conclusively prove Stephen Avery's innocence of the attempted murder and rape on the Manitowoc beach. And when the tests failed to prove him entirely innocent, that blood was sent back in a box sealed with evidence tape to the Manitowoc County Clerk of Court. And there, in 1996, that blood file sealed in the box with evidence tape took up residence in the now 11-year-old file of the 1985 case. In a box, in the open, in the Manitowoc County Clerk of Court's office, and there it sat. And in 1996, here, just a few miles north of here, Theresa Marie Harbeck was learning to drive at age 16, I assume. And the irony? Could you hear me before? Can you hear me now? All right. It is the Verizon guy who says that. Teresa was learning to drive, I assume, at age 16. And the irony? The irony is that the blood file in the clerk's office probably is what ends up in her car eventually. And time moves forward, though, to 2002. Science also has moved forward. DNA testing has improved and a new effort is made to exonerate Stephen Avery. Now, the blood in the vial, in the box, under the evidence tape, in the clerk's office, is not, you will learn, what is used for the 2002 and 2003 testing. But some materials from that box, that file, the overall file from the 1985 case, some are sent to the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory in Madison, to Sherry Colhane, to whom Mr. Kratz introduced you, and the person from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department involved. Lo, these many years later, the department was but a person from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department who documented the things that were sent from that old court file to the crime laboratory and therefore presumably looked at the box and assisted in deciding what to send. That person was by that time a lieutenant or a detective, now a lieutenant, named James Link. Now, James Link was with the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, had his office in the Sheriff's Department that adjoins, or is connected by a small courtyard to the Manitowoc County Circuit Court and the clerk's office by a small courtyard to the south of the courthouse. He was, as I say, a detective with the Sheriff's Department. Today, he is the lieutenant of the detectives 
and leads the, leads the detective unit. He documented in 2002 what was sent to the crime laboratory from that file. 2002 is the year that Teresa Holbeck graduated from the University of Wisconsin at Green Bay and came home a short distance back here to Calumet County to start off a promising career. In 2003, nearly a year after the necessary DNA samples were sent, the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory was able to establish that Stephen Avery did not rape and beat the woman on the Manitowoc Beach, as he had been saying all along. And because of the advance in science, the crime lab was better and able to do better than that. It was able to establish that Gregory Allen did. Now, unfortunately, in the time that passed, Mr. Allen had raped violently again because he had his liberty while that man did his time. But in the fall of 2003, as the weather was cooling, the state of Wisconsin at long last joined Stephen Avery in a motion to set aside his conviction and an innocent man also went home. Home for Stephen Avery. Home is the salvage yard of which you have seen. Now, many glorious pictures from high up, from low down, from angles all over. The pictures are a good deal more glorious looking than the salvage yard itself. But this was home. It's the only home that would take him back after this time. Alan Avery, Stephen's father, back there in the working shirt, as you might expect. Alan Avery started that business nearly 40 years ago on the 40 acres that he scrimped to buy. He raised sons and daughter, and they didn't wander far from the business. Chuck and Earl joined. Barb works elsewhere, works a factory job, but lives property. And this is the sort of business where the family, as you saw, shares the perimeter of this property with the 4,000 rusting, decaying cars that are the refuse, the wreckage of other people's lives. This is not a glamorous business, but it is a necessary business. It is a good business. And yes, as you will learn, you have got to get your hands dirty if you're going to be in the salvage business. Not just dirty, you get your hands bloody because you are working with rusted, jagged metal disassembling cars. And the dirt that grinds into your palms and that you find under your fingernails doesn't wash off at night. But this was his family's business and this was home. And he rejoined his brothers, Chuck and Earl, and his father, Alan, his mother, Dolores, on the family's property and at the business. He became, again, one in the Avery clan, one man in the Avery clan, and tried to resume some normalcy of life, sharing the perimeter of the salvage yard, not in a pretty house in town, on a nice stone foundation, but in a trailer home down from his sister's trailer home, both of them down from the double wide that mum and dad have, and Chuck's trailer toward the back on the path towards the crusher. And it is, although not glamorous, a worthwhile business, and it's work with its own dignity. What would we do if we didn't have the salvage yards in which to find spare parts? I guess we would be reliant entirely on the big corporations that make the cars to continue to make spare parts for them and sell them at such prices they might see fit. So it would be pretty tough without the Alan Averys and the Stephen Averys of the world. It would be pretty tough for the guy who is restoring the 1968 Pontiac GTO hardtop in his garage to do that economically, it would be pretty tough for the guy working on a 1965 Mustang convertible 
in his spare time to do that. Maybe more importantly, it would be pretty tough for the woman who's got young kids to feed and a job to hold down and medical bills, and she just has to get another 50,000 miles out of that 1988 Oldsmobile. And for these people, maybe for you, maybe for many of us, it's a good thing that young woman's father or brother or maybe she can go to the salvage yard and keep the 1988 Oldsmobile running a little while longer. Now, in 2003, when Stephen went home, Teresa or Holbeck went, also went home. Her photography business was flourishing and things were going reasonably well. In 2004, Stephen Avery filed a lawsuit seeking some recompense for the hole in his life, the time he had spent as an innocent man for the crimes that Gregory Allen committed. This was a serious lawsuit. It was in federal court down in Milwaukee, and there was no question but that a Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department and, in the end, the court system had got the wrong guy. And as that lawsuit crept forward, as lawsuits do, we came to October 2005. In October 2005, about the middle part of the month, James Link and another ranking officer of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, Sergeants Andrew Colburn, Mr. Link and Mr. Colburn, both were pulled into the lawsuit. Not as defendants or parties to the lawsuit, but as witnesses. Witnesses who had their depositions taken in the middle of October 2005. Now, a deposition typically in a civil lawsuit, is an event where you get a subpoena as a witness. You come normally to a lawyer's office, the conference room, the library, the lawyer's office. Lawyers from both or all sides are there. A court reporter is there these days, often a videographer as well and the court reporter swears the witness under oath. The lawyers ask questions of the witness under oath, and they are recorded, much as Mrs. Sashenik is recording what we're saying here. There's no judge. It happens, as I say, typically in a lawyer's office. And these two men, Link and Colburn, were witnesses. They were witnesses about their own conduct. Neither had been with the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department in 1985, but an event in 1995 or 96 came up in that lawsuit. And as to that event, both of them were witnesses being questioned about their own activity and conduct with respect to Mr. Avery's imprisonment. By the end of that month, Unfortunately, those depositions would begin to matter. And indeed, from the time it was filed in 2004, you will learn the lawsuit itself mattered. This sort of lawsuit, or the public cry of the innocent man wrongly convicted and imprisoned, has to be, as you will see here, I think, it has to be, as you get into the heads of law enforcement and begin to understand the process of law enforcement, this kind of thing has to be a nightmare for every good law enforcement officer. These folks do not want to put innocent people in prison. They want to put guilty people in prison. And when they get it wrong, when the whole system gets it wrong, there understandably are feelings of shame, of embarrassment, anger, humiliation, conflicting feelings about this. This is a, a good cop's worst nightmare, made all the more worse by the fact that Gregory Allen, free, thanks to Stephen Avery being convicted instead, Gregory Allen went on to rape and beat again.
This lawsuit kindled real difficult emotions and the four focal points of those emotions, naturally, was the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, which had investigated the rape many years ago on the Manitowoc Beach. And so, when October the 31st, 2005, Halloween rolls along, Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn not only have the lawsuit to contemplate, but now, within the last three weeks, have been made witnesses in it and had their depositions taken. October 31, 2005, began at the Avery Avery Auto Salvage Yard, much as any work day would. This was a Monday. The yard was open not long after 8 o'clock in the morning, about 8.12 in the morning, Stephen Avery called Auto Trader down in, actually I think in Hales Corners, Highway 100, down on the southwest side of Milwaukee, called Auto Trader, as he had done a number of times before, and said, we need a photographer, we have a car for sale. Now the car belonged to Barb Yander, the van, the minivan you saw computer images of, an actual photo photographs of it was there it was hers it was for sale i don't expect there will be any dispute about that and it was barb's to sell the calls about it were barb's to take the price was barb's to dicker or negotiate with people interested in making an offer on the used van steve left b jander as the name because it was the name of the seller. But Barb works during the day at a factory in town. She does not work at the salvage as Stephen did. He leaves her telephone number because that's where the phone calls have to go if there's an interested buyer. And this, you will find out, is not at all unusual or sinister. It doesn't involve luring anyone anywhere there was a car for sale there were photographs to be taken and indeed on that day alone for Teresa Holbeck with the three appointments we know about this was not only this was not the only appointment where the seller of the car was not the person whose name was given to auto trader the Schmidt's car was called in by and listed as an appointment for a Craig Sipple. And that little bit of confusion was quickly cleared up by the police. Wasn't really Sipple's car. It was Schmitz's car. No big deal. But she thought she was going to see a Craig Sipple, not a Stephen Schmitz. She thought that she was going to see a B. Yander, I suppose, not a Stephen Avery. But here's what she knew. She knew the address. Stephen gave the address. This is an address, as Mr. Kratz explains to you, and I agree, to which Theresa Holbeck had been a number of times. Probably about half a dozen, five, six, maybe more times to take photographs of cars or the trailer for sale, for example, the photograph you saw. She knows the address. She knows where she's going. As you will see, this is not a surprise or a secret to her or to anyone else. And at 11.45 morning, she called Barb Yander's number and evidently left a voicemail message saying that she would be able to get there that day sometime after 2 p.m. Now, this Manitowoc County area was Theresa's territory, so to speak, for Auto Trader. This was her freelance work, as I understand, not her main source of income. Her photography studio work, I think, probably was her passion, and this was a side job for a young photographer to generate some more money. She has a territory for Auto Trader. Stephen Avery 
wouldn't necessarily know what her territory is or whether she's the only photographer working it. And sometime close to 2.30, he's obviously getting fidgety. He makes two phone calls to her cell phone from his cell phone and uses the 6.7 feature. You will find out, which is I understand it on, the, on Teresa's telephone, then no telephone number would come up. Come up is unavailable or something like that or blocked. But he is on his own cell phone. And he may not want, not being entirely sure whose number he is calling, he may not want to be giving out his cell phone number. At least a second of those calls goes unanswered. And the time frame gets fuzzy here. Mr. Kratz said that it was late afternoon that Teresa arrived, and I'm inclined to agree with that, although it is difficult to nail down. But I think the best evidence you will hear in that, although Theresa Holbeck is in the neighbourhood of the Zipperers, who are really just, I don't know how far, but not too far down Highway 147, and then south toward Manitowoc a little bit. So they are in the general vicinity. And I think at about 2.15, she's near the Zipperers trying to figure out exactly where she's going to get to the zippers to take that photograph of their car. But so I think the best, the best estimate we'll get out of the evidence of when she actually arrives at Avery Road, which is that gravel road that leads down towards first Barb Jander's trailer and then Steve and Avery's trailer, which you saw on the north edge of the 40 acre parcel. The best estimate of when she swings her Toyota down that gravel road is probably shortly before 3.30, probably not 2.45, as one of Barb Yender's sons, Bobby Dassey, recalls it. Why do I say the best estimate? Because there is a school bus driver. Two of Barb Yender's boys, Brown and Blaine, are still in Michigan High School. And it's Monday, as I said, and they ride the school bus. And school schedules being what they are, of course, unless there is really terrible weather or something, school lets out at the exact same time every day. The bell rings and kids run out the door. The bus is going to be leaving about the same time and the bus driver will be driving the same route every day. So this bus driver, who's no relation to the Avery family or the Holbecks or anybody else for that matter, just happens to be the school bus driver. Her name is Lisa Buckner. Lisa Buckner, when interviewed by the police, says, you know, about 3.30 when I dropped the Desi boys off at the uh, head of Avery Road, I looked down the road and I saw a young woman taking a photograph or photographs of a van. Now, Buckner actually isn't sure when she's questioned about this, whether it's Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday of that week. But Monday is the day that a young woman would have been taking a photograph of the van down near the end of Avery Road. So she's got a pretty good reason to have a good idea on the time. She's going to know her route. This is something she's doing five days a week. And it's about 3.30 that she sees this young woman down the road taking a photograph of the van. Teresa Holbeck does her business. And the way this works is the person selling the car then gives the photographer $40. The photographer makes out a receipt for the transaction, typically also offers the customer the current copy, current edition of the Auto Trader magazine and leaves. And that's what Teresa Holbeck did. Stephen Avery last sees her going back out Avery Road and about to turn left to go back out to Highway 147. 
Now, somebody clearly sees her later. We don't know who. I don't know where. I don't know when. And I, like Mr. Kratz, don't know why. I do know this and can tell you that you will hear about hear this about the evidence. One of the things that the photographers who freelance or work for Auto Trader do is to go take photographs on appointments that have been set for them through the Auto Trader office. But there is another thing they can do. They get some money for that, obviously. Some of the $40 goes to the photograph. But there's another thing they can do, and that's called a hustle shot. The hustle shot is exactly that. It's business that a photographer hustles up for herself or for himself. And as an incentive for the photographer to hustle a, a little bit and, you know, thicken the auto trader magazine with new customers selling cars or boats or trailers or whatever. As an incentive for their photographers to do that, the auto trader gives the photographer a little bigger cut on a hustle shot. You are going to learn that Teresa Holbeck was good at hustle shots. She drummed up a lot of these. She was likable. She was hardworking. She was good at getting hustle shots. I have no idea. I have no idea at all, and I don't think you will either, unfortunately, whether she had a hustle shot or two or three that day or not. It would not have been uncommon. But if, in fact, she's near the zipperers at 2.15, and as I think is probable from the evidence, she doesn't show up to the Avery's until about 3.30. It's possible there's a hustle shot in there, or I suppose stopping for lunch or something. We don't know. It's possible there are hustle shots that are not scheduled through Auto Trader after the Avery shot. Because after all, I mean, if we're at 3.30, there's a good bit of daylight left in the working day, I suppose. But we don't know. What we do know is that someone sees her later. And Stephen Avery calls her later, as a matter of fact, from his cell phone. Again, he calls her cell phone at about 4.35 that afternoon. Why? Because he thought, I have got another car I would like to sell. I might as well, if she's still around, or if she can swing back, I might as well have her shoot that one too. But he doesn't get an answer from her, doesn't answer the phone. When he calls at 4.35, he sticks around. And at that point, his girlfriend, Jody Kelsey, is in jail serving some time for a drunk dry conviction. She's in the Manitowoc County Jail. Jody, you will learn, calls Stephen regularly. Because she's in jail, she has to call collect. And you can't call collect from a job to a cell phone. I don't know if you can call collect to any cell phone from anywhere. But in any event, you can't call a cell phone from the jail calling collect. So you have got to call a landline. So that's exactly what Jody Stokowski does. First, a little bit after 5.30 in the evening, she calls. And jail systems, I don't know if you know this, but jail systems, typically, and the Manitowoc County Jail clearly does this, cut off phone calls after, after 15 minutes. Inmates have a lot of time on their hands. Sometimes people they are calling don't. So the call just ends at 15 minutes. So Jody calls about a little after 5.30 on the landline. And then she calls again just before, shortly before 9. And Stephen is home. Stephen answers the phone in his little red trailer there both times. 
in both of those conversations go 15 minutes, almost to the second. He tells her that he's been doing a little cleaning. He tells her that Brendan, his nephew, Brendan Dassey, is over. They hassle. These are insane. These are inane conversations, honestly, but they are tape recorded because every phone call out of the jail is tape recorded so that we know they happen. Does it sound like he's just killed someone? No. Does he hide the fact that his nephew, Brendan, from 50 yards away or whatever it is, Barb's trailer has come over? No. Doesn't have to tell Jody that. If they were up to something, no good. But he does. Brendan is around. And for all the world, as I say, these conversations simply are inane. They don't ring of somebody who has committed a murder or in the midst of committing a murder or in the midst of mutilating a corpse or false, falsely imprisoning anyone. No screaming in the background. They are just inane telephone conversations between a squabbling boyfriend and a squabbling girlfriend. And October 31 comes to a close. It's about three days later, Thursday evening, about 5, November 3rd, when Mrs. Holbeck reports Teresa missing. Teresa lives almost next door to the elderly Holbecks. I mean, the two houses, you can see the one from the other on the dairy farm up north of here in Calumet County. So the report goes to the Callum County Sheriff's Department. It's a missing person report. No one seen Theresa since Sunday, actually. And the Calumet County Sheriff's Office responds, interviews the family, a couple of close friends, and learns very quickly about these three appointments that Theresa had on Monday. Now, at least two of those, at least two, maybe the third even, but at least two are in Manitowoc County, Zipporahs and Avery, or B. Yander. So the Calumet County Sheriff's Department calls for help from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department on this missing person report. That very night, five o'clock, the report is made. By the end of the dinner hour, Calumet County is calling the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department for a little bit of help. And who do we get? We get Sergeant Andrew Colburn. And he's told, look, two places we would like to sort of check out and see if Teresa Holbeck showed up on Monday. The Zipper Residence and Stephen Avery. Well, that's a name that rings a bell. You better believe less than three weeks or about three weeks after his deposition. And it is interesting that of those two places that Sergeant Colburn is asked to check out and inquire after Teresa Holbeck, he only goes to one. He goes to Stephen Avery's home and Stephen cooperates with him, tells him essentially, what I have told you about Teresa Holbeck coming to take the picture of Barb Yander's van doesn't clam up, doesn't seem nervous, isn't uncooperative. That very night, November 3rd, around 7 o'clock, when Sergeant Colburn knocks on his door. Out of the blue, the same night, Lieutenant James Link, now the head of the detective unit in Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, calls Calumet about this missing person report. Now, at this time, on Thursday night, November 3rd, this is, let's be clear, this is just a missing person report. A young woman who hasn't been seen for three days. It's in another county. It's not even Manitowoc County at all. And nobody has called for Lieutenant Link. Nobody's called looking for him. But the chief detective of Manitowoc County takes it upon himself 
that night to call Calumet and off to get involved in the missing person investigation where one of the appointments that was to be kept was Stephen Avery. And the next morning, Lieutenant Lank does one better than that. He goes out himself to Stephen Avery's trailer with another officer from Manitowoc, and he knocks on the door again, just as Sergeant Colburn had done the night before, inquiring after Theresa Holbeck. Again, Stephen Avery is cooperative. Lieutenant Lenk asks, Could I take a walk through your trailer? Can I look around? Do you mind? No, I don't mind. Come on in. Lieutenant Lenk walks through Stephen's trailer, sees nothing amiss, thanks him for, co for his cooperation, and leaves. November 5th, Saturday. Stephen has left to go to the family cabin up in Crivets early that morning, where Alan goes every weekend and most of the family goes too. Stephen has gone up on Saturday morning, but about 10.30 on Saturday morning, Pam and Nicole Sturm find the Toyota they suspect, correctly as it turns out, is Teresa's. As it turns out, is Teresa's in the far diagonal corner of the salvage yard from Stephen Avery's trailer. As you might expect, law enforcement officers descend on the property and the first to arrive are Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department officers at just about 11 o'clock in the morning. On those, and folks, from that point forward, from 11 a.m. on Saturday, November the 5th, 2005, this is not so much a funnel approach as you will see. It is a tunnel approach. It is a tunnel vision approach to this case. All of the feelings about Stephen Avery, all of those churning emotions, all of that within the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department floods out. You can call it tunnel vision. You can call it investigative bias. But from that point on, this investigation is about Stephen Avery and not much else. From 11 o'clock on the morning of Saturday, November the 5th, 2005, before the police say they have even opened the car, before they say they know of any blood of any sort in or on the car, before anybody even knows whether this young woman has been hurt or killed, the focus is on Stephen Avery. Other people are asked, her male roommate, former boyfriend and current friend, Ryan Hilligers. Others are asked, do you know anything about her disappearance? Did you have anything to do with it? All of them say no. And those denials, those statements are accepted. Not Stephen Avery's. Not Stephen Avery's denials or expressions of innocence. Time and again, the police go back to Stephen Avery and ask the same questions. And he talks to them every time. Even by the time his lawyers in the civil lawsuit down in federal court in Milwaukee find out about it and are trying to encourage him not to talk to the police, he talks. On the 3rd to Colburn, on the 4th to Link, on the 5th to officers up in Crivitz, on the 6th, on the 9th, he talks. And he is not believed. Do they want to go through his house? Sure, come on in my house. On November the 4th, Lieutenant Link. After the Toyota is found and the police arrive at about 11, that Saturday morning, Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn come in to work and they too arrive at the Avery property. You will hear that Lieutenant Link now has changed his sworn version of when he 
five that afternoon. And he has the ability to change his sworn story about when he arrived that afternoon at the Avery property because somehow he avoided signing in on the log. The log sheets that the Calumet County Sheriff's Department was keeping of that potential crime scene. He signed out, but somehow he managed not to sign in. And on that 40-acre parcel, after the Toyota has been turned over to the Division of Criminal Investigation in Madison, now, as search efforts are to begin on that parcel, now the Manitowoc, Sheriff's, Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department nominally turns over control of the investigation to Sheriff Jerry Pagel of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department. This county's Sheriff's Department. Normally, that afternoon, control of this investigation was turned over to Calumet from Manitowoc because of the apparent conflict of interest that Mr. Avery's lawsuit represents for the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. Now, if you were thinking, though, that the evidence will show you that Manitowoc County bowed out because of the conflict of interest after it turned the investigation over to Calumet County, if you were thinking that, it's reasonable, but you are wrong. Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department stays very much involved in this investigation. And what does Lieutenant Link and what does Sergeant Colburn do by way of volunteering to help that very afternoon, Saturday, November 5? Do they volunteer to help look in their 4,000 cars? No. Do they volunteer to search Alan and Dolores Avery's home? No. How about the pole barns or the outbuildings of the salvage property's business itself? No. They volunteer to search Stephen Avery's trailer. And they do on November 5. And once they get into that trailer with the search warrant, well, then what these two do, and there are two other officers with them, one from Manitowoc and one from Calumet. What Lincoln Campbell Colburn do is they say, don't worry, we'll take Stephen's bedroom. And they search this bedroom. Now, this is a mobile home. If the bedroom itself is 10 by 12 or 12 by 12 or 10 by 10, I would be surprised if it was much bigger than that. From me to the wall in front of you, it's about the depth and roughly the width of that bedroom in the small trailer in which Stephen Avery lives. They search, that is, Lenk and Colburn, search his bedroom on the night of November 5th. And they find nothing of interest. They see the guns, they stay on the wall. But don't bother seizing guns on the 5th. Come back to those the next day. And it is Lincoln Colburn who come back the next day. Not somewhere on the property, but to Stephen Avery's trailer. On November 6th, they search his garage. Garage is actually between him and his sister, Barb's trailer. But for our purpose here, let's call it his garage. You will find out that the Dassey boys have access to the garage. Barb has access. Family has access to this garage. But it's Link's and Colburn. It's Link and Colburn and another detective from Manitowoc County named Dave Remicker search the garage on Sunday, the sixth. They find ten, maybe it's eleven something, ten or eleven spent 0.22 casings, and they pick all of those up. But remember, remember the bullet that's found under little tent number nine on the picture that Mr. Kratz showed you, the bullet that's apparently in a crack in the floor, 
right smack in the middle of the garage near the front where the door is that no one sees or picks up on November 6th, November 7th, November 8th, and so forth through November 12th. Neither does anyone see a bullet back under the air compressor, but you will see photographs of that garage as it was in November 2005, not as it was in March 2006. When, finally, lo and behold, why there's bullets? Why don't we pick up these bullets? You will see the garage in photographs, not computer simulations, photographs, as it was in, in November 2005. You will be able to see that although the garage is very cluttered, there's no clutter under the air compressor. There's no clutter there where four months later, someone finds a magic bullet there as you walk into the garage, looking at the floor. November 7, Stephen Avery's trailer is searched again. Guess who? Lincoln Colburn. Now there probably, there certainly are over 50 law enforcement officers on this property, 24 hours a day, well before November 7th, probably by sometime late the night of the 5th, certainly by the 6th. There may be over 100 law enforcement officers working this property. They have got the family excluded. They have got a perimeter around the entire 40 acres and more they are controlling traffic and entry they are logging in who comes and goes they control this place and as you heard mr kratz say they have got any number of people searching but it's link and colburn again who are searching mr avery's trailer there in the northwest corner of that salvage yard. And on November the 7th, they find nothing of interest in his home. Tuesday, November 8th, they are back. They are back in Mr. Avery's home, back in that small bedroom. And now, Lieutenant Link, on what you will hear is probably the 7th search of that small bedroom lieutenant link now when he's the only one in that room says why my gosh there's a key sitting in plain view next to the nightstand there is you saw a picture of it as he says he found it one solitary key on a key ring connected to a fob that key fob is just like, and probably is, the one that Teresa Holbeck's younger sister bought her as a little present. One key, and one key only, on the ring connected to that fob, and it's a Toyota key. And the man who the state would have you believe bled all over Teresa's car manages not to bleed on her key. His blood isn't found there, although apparently, somehow, his DNA is, but not his fingerprints. And more interestingly, although this is a 1999 Toyota, and I gather she's been using this key, the state believes, every day to start her car and turn it off. Is the whole ex DNA and fingerprints are not found on her key. For good measure, on November 8, Lieutenant Link and Sergeant Colburn searched Stephen Avery's garage yet again. No bullets, no nothing. And the case against Stephen Avery largely is made at that point. And a whole lot of it as you all see, depends on Lieutenant James Link, Sergeant Andy Colburn. And they, both of them, 
have elected never to tell Sheriff Jerry Pagel, the man in charge of the investigation for Calumet County. They have elected not to tell him that they had their depositions taken in Stephen Avery's case probably three weeks earlier. They didn't tell anybody in the Calumet County Sheriff's Department that. November 8 is also the day that the bone fragments are found in a burn area hardly 20 yards outside Stephen Avery's home. Hardly 20 yards. Small burnt bone fragments, human burnt bone fragments, but what you will learn, and you do not hear this morning, what you will learn is that burnt human bone fragments also apparently are found in one of the burn barrels behind Barb Yander's house. Burnt the same way, fragmented about the same way, and apparently human in origin. Not Stephen Avery's burn barrel, not the one you heard about, but there are four burn barrels to the southeast. That is the most distant corner of Barb Yander's trailer from Stephen Avery's trailer. Four burn barrels back there for Barb Yander and the Dassey boys. Burnt bone fragments. And there are what seems to be probable human burnt fragmented bones found in the Red Ant gravel quarry, probably a quarter mile south of Stephen Avery's property. Now, I don't think that the state has been able to link through DNA analysis those burnt bone fragments conclusively to Teresa Holbeck. But how many burnt human bone fragments are there supposed to be? And when you only have one person missing, and the burnt human fragments in the gender burn barrel, about which you did not hear this morning, those are fragments from bones that are not connected, not part of one limb, not connected to one another within the human body. Sort of a random mix of bone fragments, as apparently are those that are found a quarter mile to the south in the Red Ant gravel pit. And as you piece this evidence together, here's what you are going to have to conclude. Bone fragments, part of parts of this body, were found where they were not burned. They were burned and moved because, again, the fragments aren't connected to one another. It's not that, you know, it's not that an arm could have been removed and burnt one place and the rest of the body another place. We have got the fragments themselves mixed up and found in three different places. The body couldn't have been burned in that way in three different places, or even two, if you set aside the Redant gravel pit, those bone fragments were moved. The question then becomes, the question you will have to decide eventually is, were they moved from Stephen Avery's burn area to the Janda burn barrel, or the gravel quarry, or were they moved from somewhere else to Stephen Avery's burn area and maybe to one of the other places where bone fragments burns are, are found. At least, did they start in the burn area and get moved somewhere else or did they start somewhere else, burn somewhere else and get moved to the burn area? Now, an expert, experts here, in what scientists will call thermal injuries to bodies, cremation, an expert or so, to the extent you hear that, may be able to give you some help on that question. Some help, but I'm not sure that an expert can answer this conclusively. 
in the end, you folks are going to have to do the hard work and the hard thinking on that. But I think when you have heard it all, we'll conclude that it's at least most likely more probable that the bones were moved to Stephen Avery's burn area, not burned there, and moved from that area to another place or two. Why? You are going to find out that there are better places, even on the Avery Salvage Yard property, in which to incinerate a body. The burn area is relatively flat and scooped out a little bit, but it's relatively flat and open. It's a burn area, like many farms or rural homes have, just folks have burn barrels. It doesn't have well-developed sides to focus heat back inward on the fuel or things being burned. Neither does it have a ready external source of fuel. But the aluminium smelter, the aluminium smelter at the Avery Auto Salvage property does. Big propane jets, an enclosed area. It will take an aluminium transmission down to liquid in a few minutes. The wood furnace that heats the outbuildings of the Avery Auto Salvage business, Chuck's home, Alan and Dolores' home, that's an enclosed area that will incinerate fuel in it very quickly. And because of we got and because we have got probable human burnt bone fragments found on the adjoining property, the gravel quarry to the south, we can't rule out other possible burn sites. And an expert won't be able to tell you what other possible burn sites there are. Expert or not, that's not something he or she will be able to tell you. But once it's more likely, as I think you will find it to be more likely, that the body is burned somewhere else and bone fragments then are brought to Stephen Avery's burn area, then he's not guilty. Because if he's not the one who burned the body somewhere else, he's not going to bring the bones back to dump them 20 yards outside his bedroom window. Neither is he going to dump a cell phone and a digital camera and a palm pilot in his own burn barrel. So many other places where these things could be disposed of out in the salvage yard whether the retention pond, whether the gravel quarry, or some other burn barrel in the woods. So once you understand that those bones probably were not burned in that burn area, the fact that they are found there, you will see tends to suggest he's not guilty. Not that he is. It is perfectly clear to anyone around this investigation on whom the focus of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department and the other investigators to the extent that tunnel vision that investigated by us bled over is perfectly clear on whom the focus of this investigation is. The police didn't kill Teresa Holbeck. Obviously, they have that in common with Stephen Avery. But they wanted to believe he did. They very much wanted to believe that he did. And whoever did kill her or burn that body, body exploited that tunnel vision pretty skillfully. Suggesting this sort of tunnel vision, suggesting this sort of investigative bias, planting blood in her car, fairly serious allegations to make. In fact, I will take away the fairly they are serious allegations. Understand them. That bias and tunnel vision are human anomalies. And if you conclude reluctantly that Mr. Link or Mr. Colburn, in addition to all the other interests they took in searching and focusing on Stephen Avery, planted blood in her car, you will also conclude that they put it there because they figured it had to be there.
It should be there. It must be him. This wasn't so much, I think the evidence will show you, an effort to frame an innocent man. It was an intense, intense desire to, conclu to conclude that he, in fact, was the guilty man. All other possible leads for information notwithstanding. It was an immediate focus on this man. Starting shortly after 11 o'clock, Saturday, November the 5th, 2005. But you do not have to take my word. I can make this work. I'm not as adept at it as I should be. I'm going to play for you two tapes. A part of it, just excerpts, short excerpts of two tapes. The first one is Saturday, November the 5th, 2005, at 11.35 in the morning. 35 minutes, give or take a minute or two, after the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department first has arrived at the Avery property because that Toyota has been found. Well before the police say they opened the Toyota, well before they say they knew of any blood, well before Brutus, the friendly cadaver dog, comes along and hits, 35 minutes after the first officers arrive, when the Sturms called and said, hey, we think we found something. Well, what I'm going to do is scroll through a transcript that we prepared and then I will play the excerpt of the tape for you. It is not a great recording. The transcript is not evidence. The tape will be, I expect. So if you think my transcript is wrong, listen to the tape. It's the evidence, or it will be. That's the tape that matters. The transcript may help you in understanding it or hearing it. Detective Remaker is calling in. He's asking for dispatch. Dispatch responds. I put unintelligible. I think it's go ahead. But I'm not sure. You can decide. Maybe you won't understand it for sure either. Detective Remaker says to the dispatcher, you will need to get hold of the crime lab for their evidence response team to start responding to this location. Now, he's out at the Avery Salvage Yard. As you will hear, dispatch says 10-4, crime lab out of Madison, Milwaukee, where? Our crime lab has branches in Warsaw, Madison and Milwaukee. The main one is in Madison. Detective Remaker says it's going to be the Madison response team, and he was right. Now, Detective Jacob signs in. This radio traffic, radio conversation, calls in with his badge number, his squad number. I'm in code. You will find out what that means. Anything you need other than a portable for Shetter. And what you'll find out is he's talking about a portable radio for Deputy Inspector Greg Shetter of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department, who is, I think, the number two or three ranking officer in the department and who's probably also going out to the Avery property. Detective Remaker, not that I can think of right now, Dennis. Dennis Jacobs, let's see if this works. Gary, I need to get a hold of the crime lab for their evidence response to, to start responding to this location. Ten four crime lab out of Madison, Milwaukee, where? It's going to be the Madison response team. It cuts off. Sorry about that. You will hear, you will get a chance to hear the whole conversation. And it continues. Dennis Jacobs says, okay, other than the car, do we have anything else? He's talking to Remicky here. Dave Remicky says, not yet. 
Detective Jacobs. Is he in custody? Detective Rumica. Negative. Nothing yet. Not who. Not is who in custody, but negative. He is not in custody. Nothing yet. Detective Jacobs. Okay, I'll gather my stuff and head out. At 11.35, is he in custody yet? Detective Remica, clearly, I gather, as I hear it, knows who Detective Jacobs is talking about. But we don't. 35 minutes after the police have arrived. And to get a better feel for that conversation at 11.35, we have to go back five minutes earlier when Detective Jacobs is calling in on the landline five minutes earlier, 30 minutes, 30 minutes after the police have arrived at the Avery Pottery after Teresa's car has been found there. Dispatcher answers the phone. Detective Jacobs, Katie, the name of the dispatcher, just rolled into the parking lot. Can you tell me, do we have a body? or anything yet do we have a body or anything yet this is 30 minutes after they found the car i don't believe so i believe they wouldn't find the first bone fragment for three days do we have stephen avery in custody though i have no idea you can hear it yourself Good morning, man. Talk County Sheriff's Department. Katie speaking. Katie, uh, just rolled into the parking lot. Can you tell me, uh, do we have a body or anything yet? I don't believe so. We have Stephen Avery in custody, though. I have no idea. Now, I will finish it out so that you can link it up to the call. The discussion with Detective Remica five minutes later. Oh, I heard him say, pick up that party. Oh no, the dispatcher says, Pete, who is just another Manitowoc County Sheriff's Officer, is sitting up there waiting and stopping people from going in that. He found someone with a body only warrant for a, uh, for a department. A body only warrant is an arrest warrant or a pinch warrant where they are going to take the person into custody rather than immediately grant him bail. Okay. Do we have, all right, I will talk to Rimika. Yeah, your best bet is to talk because nothing has come through. We have the vehicle, that I know, but more than that, I don't know. All right, bye-bye. Oh, I heard him say pick up that party. I... Oh, no, we have, while Pete is sitting up there waiting and stopping people from going in and that, he found somebody with a body only warrant for our oh. department. Okay, do we have, uh, all right, so do I, we have, I'll talk to Remica. Yeah, your best bet is to talk, because nothing has come through. We have the vehicle, that I know. All right, thank but you. What more, I don't know. All right, bye. Bye. So you can take the tunnel vision and investigative bias from them, not from me. Now, in the end here, in the end, when you have heard it all, there's not a speck of Teresa's blood anywhere in the Stephen Avery trailer. There's not a piece of hair, nothing. Nothing to suggest she's ever been in the trailer. And only the magic bullet found four months later to suggest she's ever been anywhere near the garage. And when you consider the forces, the emotions, the very human failings at work here, it's no surprise that the blood from that unsecured vial in the box 
in the clerk's office that Lieutenant Link examined back in 2002 ends up in that Toyota because that's where it ought to be. Is he in custody yet? Jerome Buting and I will not ask you to make that kind of snap judgment here. The Holbacks deserve better than that. The police deserve better than that. You owe it to yourselves in making this decision to do better than a snap judgment. A snap judgment 30 minutes after that Toyota is found. Jerome Buting and I are going to ask you to do your job right. Think long and hard about all of the evidence. But in the end, after the full and fair consideration of everything and everyone, the full and fair consideration that Stephen Avery did not get in 2005 from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. We're going to ask you to send him home. We're going to ask you to send him home again. We're going to ask you to get it right this time. We're going to ask you to set it right when this case is over. Thank you, Mr. Strang. Members of the jury, we're going to take an afternoon's break now. We'll resume in 15 minutes and the state will begin the presentation of evidence. I will remind you again, as I will a number of times throughout the trial, do not discuss the case during the break or at any other time until all the evidence has been received. All right, Council, we should be ready to go promptly at 2.45. At this time, the state may call its first witness. State will call Mike Halbach, Your Honor. Please raise your right hand. Please be seated. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Michael B. Halbach, H A L B A C H. Mr. Halbach. Did you know a young woman by the name of Teresa Halbach? I did. Describe, who was Teresa, please? Teresa was, or is my sister. She was born on March 22nd, 1980. Grew up with my family on a dairy farm near Hilbert. She loved travel. She had been to Spain, Mexico, New Zealand, Australia. She had many friends. She loved doing things with her friends. She was a good friend of mine as well. She was my big sister, someone I could go to talk to about any problems I would have. We would go to lunch, talk about her business, which she ran called Photography by Teresa. And in August of 2005, she coached her sister's seventh grade volleyball team to second place in their league. So I know that something she really loved doing was working with those kids. That was the main focus of her photography business as well. And she graduated from the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay in 2002 major in photography, and she graduated summa cum laude. I'm going to hand you a couple of exhibits. First exhibit is that which is marked as exhibit number one. Could you tell us what that is, please? It's a photo of Teresa. Do you know when that photo was taken? Not exactly, but by the looks of it. It was fairly recent. I would say 2005. Does that particular photo accurately depict your sister, Teresa? And as it did the last time that you saw her? Yes. By the way, when was the last time that you saw her? Do you recall? 
The last time I saw my sister was October 30th, 2005, the day before she went missing. We were at my grandparents' house. It was my grand grandpa's Halloween. It was my grandpa's. Halloween was my grandpa's birthday, and the day before we went to their house, the entire family was there. Aunts, uncles. Mr. Halbach, I'm sure we'll get better at this with the jury, but I'm going to direct your attention to the large screen in the courtroom. Is that another version or a larger version of what's been marked as exhibit number one? Yes, it is. You mentioned that Teresa was part of your family. Can you tell us who else was involved in your immediate family, please? I have an older brother, Tim, and then Teresa would be the second oldest, myself, and two younger sisters, Katie and Kelly, parents, Tom and Karen. Directing your attention to exhibit number two, I'm also putting that on the screen for the jury. Can you tell us what that is, please? It's a photo we took outside my parents' farm. I believe it was in 2004, that summer, early fall. It's a photo we used for our Christmas cards that year. And it's a photo of my family. And as you are pointing to exhibit number two, Please, could you tell us, or tell the jury, who all is in that photo? Tom, Teresa's, I guess legally would be her stepdad, standing in the back with the jean shirt. <coughs> to his left is Katie, younger sister, and to her left is Kelly, the youngest of the family. In front, from left to right, is the oldest brother, Tim, and then my mom, Karen, then myself holding our dog, Eddie, and Teresa is on the end. All right. How often would you get to see Teresa? How often would you interact with her? Every few days, I would probably talk to her either on the phone or if it was a weekend, we would probably see each other. If I was at my parents' house, if she would stop over during the week or over the weekend. So I would see her, see her, or at least talk to her every three days or so. Are you familiar with Teresa's electronic devices that she owned? Yes, I am. Could you tell us about those, please? She owned a cell phone, a Motorola Razor, and I know this because she talked on it a lot. She also had a Palm Pilot. I believe it was, the brand was Palm One, I believe. She had tons of photography equipment, obviously. Hasselbl Hasselblad, is on is one camera canon is another and through one of her jobs she had a little snapshot camera for the job she worked through auto trader magazine she had this little snapshot camera to do that job do you know what kind of vehicle teresa drove it was a rav4 it was bluish green in color. We're going to have the actual photo marked as an exhibit, but I'm going to direct your attention up to the large screen. Could you tell us what it is we're looking at there? Could you repeat that? Sure. I'm about to have this photo made part of the, or to complete the record, but could you tell us, and can you look at the large screen and tell us what it is that we're looking at? That's Teresa. 
holding one of her cameras she had with her professional photography business, standing outside the driver's side door of her Toyota RAV4. Mr. Habak, could you, regarding Teresa's RAV4, could you tell us how often you had contact with that vehicle? I would say I have ridden in it a few times, but I would see it whenever I saw her. It was her only vehicle, so when she would drive it, or when she would drive it around, she would be in that vehicle. So I was very familiar with it and had ridden in it a few times. Teresa's license plate said, as you sit here today, did you know or were you familiar with what Teresa's license plates were? Yes, I was. And how are you familiar with that? One of Teresa's jokes and how she remembered her license plate, her license plate numbers or letters and numbers were SWH-582. She remembered those letters because she would joke that it stood for single white hop on. Mr. Hopak, I provided you with two exhibits, number, exhibit number three and exhibit number four. Can you tell us though what those are please? Pictures of Teresa's license plate. And which one of them has the sticker on it? Exhibit number three. All right. Just so the jury is shown exhibit number three, I'm going to direct your attention to the large screen. Again, what is it that we're looking at? Teresa's license plate. SWH582, is that right? That's correct. Excuse me, Mr. Kratz, just for the record, I think the photo of Teresa Holbach with the RAV4 was referred to as an exhibit, but we haven't marked it yet. Are you still looking for the original? We are, Judge. Although we have the original, Judge, we'll be referring to it either with this witness or the next witness who also has familiarity with that. Just, I think, to keep the record straight, it should be reflected that while it may have been referred to as an expected exhibit number, it has yet to be numbered. All right, Judge. You may proceed. And the other vehicle, or what I guess would be considered the front license plate, you said that was, that was exhibit number four, is that right? Yes. And I have now directed your attention to that on a large screen, screen, excuse me, once again, exhibit number four. The large screen photo here accurately reflects exhibit number four. Is that correct? Yes, it does. All right. I have now handed you what's been marked for identification as exhibit number five. Tell us what that is, please. It is the picture we looked at not too long ago with Teresa standing outside the driver's side of her Toyota RAV4. Just for the record, exhibit number five then would be the image that we're looking at on the screen now. Is that correct? Yes. All right. By the way, Mr. Habak, did you have an idea as to when this photo was taken? Did I ask you this? You didn't ask me that. I mean, I would guess sometime maybe 2004, maybe early 2005. I guess the question that the jury needs to know is, was this Toyota RAV4 the vehicle in which your sister is standing in front of, the same vehicle that she was driving at the end of October of 2005? 
Yes, it is. You mentioned that Teresa was involved in the photography business. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, through college, she developed a passion for photography and hence why she declared that as her major. I would say her sophomore and junior year, she worked at Bay Park Square Mall in Green Bay at picture people taking photos of children, mainly families. After she got done doing that, during her last semester at Wisconsin, Green Bay, she started this internship with Tom Pierce of Pierce Photography in Green Bay, doing many of the same things, taking pictures of children, families, some, and also doing weddings on the weekend. So she continued working with him, and then later on in 2002, she started her business, which she named Photography by Teresa which continued up until Halloween of 2005. Now, you indicated that you are familiar that at least one of her clients was Auto Trader Magazine. Is that what you told us? Yes, that's correct. She in, I think it was October of 2004, she started working for Auto Trader Magazine as a way to supplement her income for her professional business. Since she was just starting out with her own business, she wouldn't always have clients. So yeah, she has a way to have some steady income. She got this job with the Auto Trader magazine to take pictures of vehicles in people's yards that they were selling themselves. First photo I'm showing you has been marked as exhibit number seven. Can you tell us what that is, please? Exhibit number seven is Canon PowerShot A310. It's the box for the Canon camera. It's not the camera itself. And once again, were you familiar that that was one of the cameras that Teresa had used in her employment? Yes, I am. In her employment with Auto Trader, yes. The other exhibit. I think it was exhibit number six. Is that correct? That's correct. Can you tell me what that is, please? It's a box for a Palm One Zyre 31 Palm Pilot. And once again, the large screen. Does that accurately depict the box, again, recovered from your sister's home, the box that she saved for her Palm Pilot? Yes, it does. Was your sister kind of a pack rat? Did she save this kind of stuff? Having gone through her stuff, yeah, she saved a lot of stuff. Yes. Was your sister married? No, she's not. Who did she live with? She lived with a friend of hers from high school named Scott Blodorn. He lived in the upstairs of the apartment or of the house she was renting from my parents. How close was this to your parents' house? Down the road a short ways, eighth mile, roughly quarter mile, not too far. Okay, Mike, did you ever have an opportunity to see or talk with your sister as she either went to work for the Auto Trader magazine or as she went to work at her own studio? She went there. Yes, in, in other words, were you familiar with how she dressed to go to work? Yes. Can you tell us about that? She would always dress professional, especially when she was going to her professional photography business. You know, black pants, a nice shirt. And if she happened to be doing auto trader that same day, she would go in those same clothes. But if it was, if she wasn't going to her job that day, she would dress comfortably, not necessarily in professional clothes, but nice clothes nonetheless. Might be a nice pair of jeans and a nice shirt, or, you know, maybe khakis and a shirt, sweatshirt. 
Mike, as long as we have the photos, again, what we're looking at here, that's a picture. Which picture is that, number six? That is exhibit number six. We're going to have the actual exhibit marked so that we don't have, we don't just have a photo of it. Janet, is that gonna be number eight? Yes. Mr. Wiegert, could you provide that to the witness? Mr. Habak, we're showing you what's marked for identification as exhibit number eight. Can you show the jury and tell them what that is, please? This is the same box as in the exhibit number six. It's the box for Teresa's Palm 1 Zyre 31 Palm Pilot. And if I'm not mistaken, exhibit number seven, I think, was the box for the Canon PowerShot A310. Is that right? That's correct. We're going to have that box actually marked for identification as exhibit number nine. Once again, Mr. Weaker will be providing that to you. If you could show it to the jury and tell them what exhibit number nine is, please. Exhibit number nine is the box for the Canon PowerShot, the A310 that Teresa used for her auto trader job. Once again, after your sister's disappearance and after investigators began contacting you specifically and your family, these items were found in her personal effects and turned over. Is that right? That's correct. Can you tell me who Pam Sturm is? Pam Sturm, to me, would be my first cousin once removed. She would be my grandma's sister's daughter. Okay. The involvement of Pam and her daughter, Nicole, after your sister was missing. Could you describe that for the jury? You said her involvement? Yes. Pam Sturm was the person who ended up finding Teresa's vehicle on the Avery salvage yard. I recall coming home that day after I had been with my brother driving in her being inside my parents' house crying and my mom telling me that we found the vehicle. Or Pam found the vehicle, Pam and her daughter, Nicole. So I guess that would be her involvement. All right, let's go back just a little bit, Mike, if we can. After your mom reported your sister missing on the 3rd of November, how was it that you were informed of that? On Thursday, November 3rd, I was working. I got a call from my mom that afternoon at about 2 o'clock or 2.30, wondering if I knew where or if I had talked to my sister in the previous, you know, since Sunday. And I said that I hadn't. And so I went on to call one of Teresa's good friends at her work and asked her if she could, if she had known where Teresa could be, because it was completely unlike her to go somewhere without telling anyone, especially a family member, a good friend, her roommate, or her boss. So I guess after we made those calls, it became very evident to me that something was seriously wrong, and I expressed that to my mom. Then shortly after, and she was, you know, she was in agreement, obviously. She knew something was wrong, just like everyone else did. Did the family ask for some assistance, and did you receive it from some of Teresa's friends regarding searching for her? In searching for her, we you know, all we had to do was make a couple of phone calls to some of Teresa's friends and they would call numerous other people. We needed help passing, passing out posters on Friday, November 4th, and also doing searches by car on Saturday, the 5th, and doing searches by foot a few days following that. So whenever we needed help, 
we had help from Teresa's friends, family members, community members, anyone who wanted to help, who had time, would help us out in searching for Teresa. Who is Ryan Hillegas? Ryan Hillegas is, he was Teresa's ex-boyfriend. They were together a few years and then were off a few years once they went to college. And he basically organized most or probably all the search efforts that we did for Teresa. Him, along with Scott Blodorn, did the majority of getting people together and telling people where to go to search. I ask you to refer back to this photo. Can you tell me what exhibit that is again? Exhibit number five. Okay. I can see by your sister's physical stature, but if you can just verify for us, was Teresa in good physical condition? Yes, she was. She had a, she went to a gym. I don't know how regularly, but she had a membership at a gym and was, seemed physically fit. Yes. Mike. I think you talked about on the third meeting with your family and on the fourth, really, the citizen efforts for Teresa's search kind of ramped up. But can you give us any more details about that? Yeah, on the, well, the day we reported Teresa missing, that Thursday, we had got a call from a man named Jay Breyer who offered his services at Youth Educated in Safety, which is a missing persons organization. He offered to make copies and make up a missing persons post. So we took him up on that offer and that night, finalized the poster, and then the following afternoon, we had got copies. He had made the copies and around 2 or 2.30 in the afternoon was when we were meeting him, was when we were meeting with whoever had the time, the vehicle, to drive across all of Northeast Wisconsin to put up these posters, which basically said, you know, missing person. Teresa Halbach, height, weight, what she was wearing that day. So that's what happened on Friday afternoon. Mike, Mr. Fallon is going to hand you what's been marked for identification as exhibit number 10. I'm going to put it up on the screen for the jurors. Can you tell us what we're looking at, please? That's the missing persons poster that Jay Breyer helped us make that we put up on the third, or the Friday, the fifth, or, yeah, the fourth. Friday, the fourth, that's right. Indicates that your sister was five feet, six inches tall, 135 pounds. Is that approximately accurate? Yes. Now, after, first of all, let me ask you where, where these posters distributed, if you recall. It would have been a very large area of Northeast Wisconsin, including Appleton, Green Bay, Manitowoc, Chilton, south towards Milwaukee, east to the lakeshore, and I recall semi-drivers wanting to, you know, stop at the house, pick up some flyers because they were concerned as well. And they were going to Madison, Milwaukee, and further. So they had volunteered to put up posters for us on the route. Mr. Habak, let me ask you this. Did you try to recreate from the 31st of October routes that Teresa may have taken? Yes. Yeah. So those were our main areas. We wanted to put up those posts as well as to search by vehicle and by foot because we could trace her whereabouts to, you know, a certain location. That's where you want to focus most of your effort. So that's what we did. All right. Perhaps you answered this and I, I apologize if you did, but do you recall how many thousands of those posters you distributed? I guess I can't recall specifically, but it would be, you know, probably a couple thousand. All right. Now, 
We're going to hear from Mr. Hillegas a little bit later in the trial regarding the specifics of the missing persons investigations, but did those search efforts include actually walking around or looking in roadways or ditches? Yeah, that Saturday morning, the 5th, that morning, it was about 7 a.m. A group of volunteers met at my sister's house and we set out by vehicle to, to basically trace the routes that she may have taken that Monday. And certain people were given different areas, not necessarily the places she definitely traveled, but perhaps she drove down to Milwaukee to meet with someone or drove up to Door County. So we had people driving in those areas as well. But myself specifically, I went with my brother to the places where we and the routes that we thought for sure she could have taken, you know, since we were her brothers, we can get it in her mind better than anyone. So we drove over there. I can recall specifically driving down Highway 147, getting out, looking down embankments where if you would drive by casually, you wouldn't be able to see down there. So we thought maybe she had gotten in an automobile accident, was trapped, you know, unconscious, whatever it may be. So we wanted to do what we could to eliminate that possibility. So, you know, we looked wherever we could, drove around as many roads as we could, side roads, back roads, whatever, just looking for signs of her vehicle or Teresa herself. And until that call came, or until the news came on the 5th that Teresa's vehicle had been found, was that your hope that there had been some accident or something? Yeah, I mean, from the start, I think it's just the way my family is, is we're strong. Optimistic also, you know, realistic too. But yeah, we hope to find some sign and we hope we would find Teresa alive. So when we found her vehicle, it was good because we were getting closer to finding Teresa. So we were happy to find the vehicle, but we didn't find Teresa. So that's half the goal was missing. We didn't accomplish half the goal when we found the vehicle. All right. Mike, I had mentioned at the early stages of the presentation of this case, in fact, to the jury, about meetings that you had with law enforcement, meetings you had with me individually throughout the case. Have you been kept informed as to the developments and the evidence, not just that was found, but the evidence that was going to be presented at this case? Yes, we had always, were informed in advance of anything, whether it be a news conference, whether it be information that would be submitted to the courthouse and available to the media shortly therefore. We would always be aware of what was going to be said in the media or or whatnot. And in advance of every court hearing, we have been kept informed of what we would hear that day, just so there were no surprises. So we could pre- prepare ourselves emotionally for those events. That includes the physical evidence that is going to be presented at this trial? Yes, that's correct. The last question I have, Mike, and I'm going to apologize in advance as to the insensitivity of it, but at any time after the 31st of October, had you ever seen, spoken from, or heard from your sister? Teresa Halbach. No, I have not. I would move the admission of Exhibit 1 through 10. Any objection? No objection at all. Those uh, those exhibits are admitted. No further questions. Mr. Strang? Is this working now? Yes, it is. All right. Thanks for coming. And I don't have a lot of questions. I don't want to make this any harder a day for you than it's already been. But 
we have established that Teresa was five foot six, about 135 pounds, back in October of 2005? Yes. Give or take, you said she was fit. She was an athlete to some extent? To some extent. She played a little in high school, but I know she would exercise at our home as well. Sure. Little volleyball, was that her sport, or basketball, or both? Well, she coached her sister's seventh grade volleyball team, so there was definitely an interest there. Was that her sport in high school? She played some. I don't think she played past her sophomore year, but... Okay, but, you know, I mean... Somebody who is at least reasonably athletic and fit. Right. In addition to working out at home, she belonged to some private gym somewhere? Correct. Okay. You guys were all raised on a dairy farm. Did you grow up there? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. Working on a dairy farm? Yes. And when you say for the most part, is that... Not when you were a little bitty boy or? Up until I was eight years old on, I was on the dairy farm, yes. Okay, sure. And you, the kids, helped out with chores, I assume? Correct. Like all farm kids have to? Yes. That included Teresa? She didn't help out in the barn as much as she helped out in the house, babysitting for our sisters and taking care of chores in the house. She did get acquainted with the milking, though, at some point, I assume. Very seldomly. Was that mostly the boys? Yeah. Yes. She was someone who had a good sense of humour? Yes. Also could stand up for herself, though? Absolutely. A little bit feisty in a good way? Yes. Yeah, and I don't mean in a bad way, but I mean she was personable? Yes, independent. And your family? I'd take, I'd take it is tight-knit, your immediate family? Yes. By that, I mean Tom and Karen, your folks, or you and Tim, Katie, Kelly and Teresa? Yes. But you guys also have a pretty good extended family in this area, as I understand it. Yes, we do. Has the family been in Calumet County, or this area, for generations? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, in other words, you know Pam Sturm, you were, st you were saying, is a first cousin, once removed? Correct. I couldn't possibly tell you how you got there, but, I mean, you have got all kinds of cousins, aunts, uncles. Yes. That kind of thing in the area? Yes. So, in addition to Teresa's friends, you had a lot of family to pull on when looking for her? Correct. This, this effort to retrace her steps on October 31st, did that, did that get going, Mr. Holbeck, pretty much right away the evening that you all reported her missing? Yeah. Yeah. We had talked about where we knew Teresa was on the 31st, what appointment she had, where she was supposed to be before then, you know, where she was supposed to be after then and the days following as well. Okay. On the 31st, were you able to na nail down appointments? Yes. So, I mean... Do you think it was that Thursday night that you figured out that Avery Auto Salvage was one of the appointments, if you remember? I don't remember exactly if it was that night, or if it was the next day, or it was one of those two. Either Thursday night or Friday morning, the 4th? Yes. Okay. And at some po point, pretty quickly, the media all got interested in this. Am I recalling that correctly? Yes. Was it Friday already on the TV? They were talking about the Avery Auto Salvage 
or flying over it, that kind of thing? I don't recall. Specifically, myself, you know, seeing the media involvement, saying Stephen Avery, but I know that they reported on the missing persons case involving my sister that Thursday night. Oh, right away, Thursday night. Correct. And then Friday, and I know by Saturday, there was a lot of media coverage. Yes. Not that you were watching, but, I mean, you were out, that you were just sort of aware of it. Yes. Did you? Did you have access to her computer, passwords or account information for, like, her cell phone, for example, or bills? that kind of thing cell phone yes computer password yes she had shared that with you at some time earlier i did business work for her website graphics so oh i yeah i just knew it through that so you knew it through that correct because you would have a reason to get onto her computer to help her with her website. Well, I didn't have to go to on her computer, but I had to connect to a web host. Sure. Just to put stuff for her website. So. Okay. I'm nodding like I know what you were talking about, and I really don't. But the point is you had... You had access to her password information so you could check her cell phone bill. I never did. I don't know. So since I never did, I wouldn't know if I had the right password for her cell phone bill. I knew okay. her password for her voicemail. And that's where I was going. I think, I think on Thursday evening, November 3, Somebody was able to get her cell phone records on the computer, but that was not you? I don't think on her computer, no. Okay, and you didn't have her voicemail? I said I did, did have her voicemail password. You did have her voicemail password. Okay, did you check her voicemails? I did. Do you remember when you did that? It was probably Thursday evening, early evening. After your mom? Yes. Had? Yes. Filed a missing persons report? Yes. Okay. So I take it you were at work earlier that day? Correct. And the missing person report was sort of at the end of the day, five o'clock or something? Correct. Were you familiar enough with Teresa Halbeck's everyday stuff to know what what she carried keys to? I mean, yes. I think I would have an idea of what keys she would have, yes. Okay. Let's just, let's start with the, with the house that she and Scott Blodon were sharing. This was the older farmhouse? At one point, it was a farmhouse. Okay. Is it actually on the Halbeck farm or just next door or? It's next door, my parents' home, the house and the land. Okay, but it. It's not, it doesn't share a driveway at all. Yeah. It has its own driveway. Separate parcel, but next door. Correct. Can you see the two houses from one another? You have to look through a line of evergreens and there's a big shed a little further back. But you can see it through the trees. Yes. But they are next door neighbors, essentially, although it's a rural area. Correct. Okay. And I take it there was there was a house key to the house. Go ahead. Yes, there was. Do you know whether there was a separate garage key? I believe that's correct. Okay. I would imagine there was. And do you have, do you have any way of knowing 
whether Teresa would also have had the keys to your folks' house? I don't think she did. You told us the Toyota was the only car she was driving, so she didn't have the keys to other cars, as far as you know? Correct. She didn't. No other keys. Swipe card for the gym? I can't recall if she specifically had a swipe card. She must have had something to get into the gym. I forget what it, what it would have been. Okay. And if you know, was she someone with, like, a lot of people, I guess, who would have had some doodads or charms or that sort of thing on the coach, on the keychain? I don't ever recall her having any of that. A lot of fancy stuff on her keychain, no. Okay. The gathering at was at Grandpa's house on Sunday, October 30. That's correct. For his, for his birthday? Correct. And then, I think, were there, if you know, did she, had she had plans to go to a Halloween party the Saturday night right before that? I believe so. Earlier in the evening, she was helping me with a wedding, shooting a wedding video. After that, I think she would have, she would have went to a Halloween party. I believe that's correct. Okay. Saturday night, October 29. Right. Yeah, it would have been later on in the, in the night. Let's just sort of help the jury with that. You're, you're a videographer. You're in the video business. Correct. So not only would she be a photographer for weddings, but you also videotape weddings as a business or a side business at times? Well, that was the only one that I had. That was my first time, and I haven't done one since. Okay, but the two of you were helping each other out with that one. Right. I didn't notice one in the picture, whichever number it is where Teresa is standing next to her Toyota when she has got a camera. I didn't notice there, but did she ordinarily carry a purse? I don't recall her having a purse. Well, I can't say for sure. That's okay. That's all right. How about, I mean, did you, did you notice, was she a jewelry person, bracelets, necklaces? Not a whole lot of jewelry, really, at all. I don't. Maybe a couple of rings. Not bracelets, though, or necklaces? Probably not too often. How about earrings? I don't recall her wearing earrings very often, either. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Kratz, any redirect? Not for this witness, Judge. Thank you. Very well. You are excused. Next witness, Judge. You may call your next witness. Tom Pierce. Raise your right hand, please. Please be seated. You may proceed, Matter Kratz. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. Thomas Pierce, P E A R C E. Mr. Pierce, how are you employed? I'm sorry? How are you employed? I'm self-employed. Can you tell the jury in what capacity? I'm a professional photographer. I have my own studio. Did you know a young woman by the name of Teresa Habak? Oh, yes, I did. Can you tell the jury how you first became knowledgeable about Ms. Habach? It was in January of 2002 through an internship program through the university. She approached me to do an internship through the university and I took her on as an intern. And from there on through the intern program, which ends when she graduates, I saw that she was an exceptional person in photography and for her age, 
that I ask her to stay on and work through my studio with me doing weddings and portraits. What university was this? University of Green Bay. Yeah, I think you mentioned that you had seen something in her that actually made you offer her a job. Can you tell us what that was? Well, you know, in this field, you see, and I've I've worked with other interns, and some of them do have the drive, the passion, the want, and knowing that, being a photographer, a lot of people think it's very easy. It's a lot of hours. It's a lot of dedicated work. And she had that, and I hadn't seen that in many people in a lot of years, and I was impressed with that. She knew the responsibility, the sacrifices it took, and she was eager to learn. She was consistently asking questions and from doing different jobs and so on. So I was very impressed with her and that's why I asked her to stay on. Was she technically good at what she did? Yes. The university, I also went to school, but not here in Green Bay. They teach you the book. And how should I say you should know the rules before you know how to break them? And that's part of out in the field. And that's why I think the internship program is a good program because it has in many different fields, people come out and see what it's really like in everyday life and not so much how the book says it, but You've got to know the book, but you have to break the rules when you're out there. Now, after offering Teresa a job or employment through your studio, how long did that last? And did that evolve into some other business relationship? As far as working for me, or I should say really with me, she was a go-getter. Like I said, she had that passion. And I looked and as a, when you're a staff photographer for someone, you have got to abide by their ways of doing things, their policies, because you're working for them. So you have to do stuff their way. Well, I didn't want to hold her back because she was incredibly involved and had that passion for this. So on the other hand, I didn't want to not lose her, but have her go out and go hit and miss, hit and miss, which a lot of young photographers do. I had a full studio, plenty of room for both of us. So we sat down and we talked and we did something that no one has ever done before. She started her own business, um, not in competition, but complimenting each other. So she worked out of my studio. She used all the facilities of the studio, but she ran her own business through that, through, through my studio. Uh, meanwhile, we cooperated in different advertising together, promotions, learning, helping one another. I would book weddings for her. She would book for me. There was never any competition between us. It was something unusual, but it worked out very well for both of us. Did she call upon you for advice? Many times, yes. And it was basically not only the technical end of it, the photography end of it, but on how to run a business, what's needed behind the scenes. Uh, and that's where in this business, a lot of people that get into that the photography business, they know photography, but they don't know the business end of it. So yes, I, I did mentor her in a lot of different areas, 38 years of experience. And I wanted to share that with her because I could see that she was basically like me when I came out of college, of school. I was eager, I had the passion we had a lot of similarities. I graduated from uh, with a degree in photography. I was the 
uh, also worked the photo school paper and and she did and I worked at many different studios before I moved up here in the Green Bay market so we had that same background and I think it's a duty for any of us um, to share what we've learned our experiences with someone and and coming up uh, with someone up and coming I think Mr. Pierce you talked about weddings and portraits and the like. That was, or at the, by the fall of 2005. Had Teresa been developing a particular niche within the photography business? Your Honor, I wonder if we could approach the sidebar for just a moment. Sure. Mr. Pierce, could you discuss whether or not Teresa had developed a particular niche within the photography business? I think if there was any one area, it was children. She loved to photograph children of all ages. She had a knack for that. But as far as a niche, I mean, we all, that would be her certain niche. But she was well versed at doing weddings and good at doing weddings and portraits and family. But her love was doing children from all ages of children. Now, as part of that business, as part of Teresa's photography business, were you aware of a particular client that she serviced, which was Auto Trader Magazine? There was a time when she had told me about that, uh, that she uh, picked up a client, which was Auto Trader. And she would be running around taking pictures of cars. Yes, I was aware of that. All right. And has she ever asked your opinion or advice about working for Auto Trader or that kind of photography? I don't think she asked my advice, but I think I may have suggested something to her. Her photography business was picking up for <clears throat> studio wise a lot. And it seemed like when she, it, it seemed when she first started with Auto Trader was just on Mondays. Mondays, we're typically closed in the industry because we work a lot of Saturdays. So it seemed all of a sudden that she not only had to do Auto Trader on Monday, but possibly Wednesdays and uh, some Saturdays. She was constantly telling me that she was running, doing auto trader. And I could see that she was starting to burn the candle at both ends. Um, at one time, I set her down and I said, gee, you know, you are running here, you're running here, you're running. And I didn't want her to, to a burnout point. So I just asked her. How is Auto Trader? Is it a good client? Blah, blah, blah. We never talked on how much she was making or whatever. That, that was never discussed. I mean, that was where we drew the line in our business end of it. But I was more concerned about her well-being of running, of the constant running. She was constantly running and that's what she enjoyed. So that was the only time I really had any discussion with her about Auto Trader. Let me ask you this, Mr. Pierce. Are you familiar with the defendant, Stephen Avery? As far as familiar with him, as far as what? Have you heard the name before the 31st of October? Just one time. And I think it was the spring, late spring or early summer. Teresa had mentioned to me, she said, it kind of matter of factly, you will never guess whose car I was taking pictures of. And she told me the name and it didn't ring a bell. Uh, she actually had to remind me or, or say, oh, that was the guy that was wrongfully convicted and so on and so forth 
and we had a little discussion and then I remembered the case and so on. And so we talked about uh, a little bit about being out and about running around all over the country by herself and her safety and so on and so forth. And that was basically it. That was the only time she ever mentioned it to me. All right. We've learned that Teresa Habak drove a 1999 Toyota RAV4 SUV. Pictures in front of you. Would you look on the back? What exhibit number is that? Uh, zero five CF three eight one exhibit five. All right. Have you ever seen that vehicle before? Oh, sure. She was working with me when she purchased it. Actually, I took that picture, and she was happy as a lark to have her first car. She used to have a beater that was an older car, not a beater. Um, and now this allowed her freedom to go. Yeah, she was very happy with that car. Turning now to a more serious series of topics, Mr. Pierce, sometime after the 31st of October, after that Monday, after the Halloween, did you see Teresa the next day at work, Tuesday, the 1st of November? No, like I said earlier, Mondays we were closed. Actually, the last time I saw Teresa was Saturday before the 31st. When Tuesday came, she had her own hours because she had her own business. Since I'm there like 60 hours a week, she may have been there one week 20 hours all depended on her schedule and so on, but she always kept me informed of what she's going to be uh, gone for a day. Uh, like, did she have appointments? Was she going to take off for a weekend, etc.? She was very responsible in that sense, extremely responsible for a young person. Well, Tuesday came, and by noon she wasn't there. I didn't think too much. Oh, okay, I know she was there Saturday working, did Auto Trader, so I'm going through my mind. Well, what? I knew Wednesday, because every Wednesday morning she actually was one of the founders of the BMG group, uh, BMG Marketing Group, Business Marketing Group that meets once a week business leaders they they go over leads and what's going on in green bay and so on she was one of the founders and very active in it uh, she usually would come in oh about mm, sometimes 11 11 30 on that wednesday religiously because she she would be in town for that meeting so wednesday around noon she didn't show up. I thought, okay, this is a little strange. I tried calling her and I got her cell, but her phone book, and it was full where I couldn't even leave a message. Her voicemail? Her voicemail box. That's it. Yes, it was full. I couldn't even leave a message. I thought this was a little strange because typically you get right through to her. She was very good at returning calls, very good at leaving messages and letting me know. So kind of, well, maybe she's sick, you know, with the flu, flu season, covered up under the covers, turning the cell phone off, just go and doing that. Sure. So I thought, well, for sure she'll be in Thursday. And I had called a couple times her cell phone. So by Thursday, now I haven't heard from her. This is Thursday, the 3rd of November? Right, yes. Okay, what did you do then? Uh, I tried to call her again, same thing with the phone. Now some of her work was coming in, being shipped 
and to be processed. And, and I knew that she knew she kept track of that. So if she was out of town or sick, I think she would have called me by this time. And I started getting really, really worried. I didn't know who to call, you know, her friends, etc. So I think was around one o'clock somewhere in that time period I called Karen Teresa's uh, mother uh, seeing if she knew that was the only phone number I had other than Teresa's I didn't have any of her friends and and talked to Karen about it and she was going to call some of her friends or she already had and the next thing I know, it was 10 o'clock on the news. I heard it was officially that Teresa was missing. Perhaps you can help us, Mr. Pierce. Are you familiar with the use of digital cameras, digital film, and how a digital camera can imprint or create an electronic signature on photos that are taken therefrom? Uh, I'm not real. I'm not a real good expert on digital, but I know some of what the digital cameras do. If that's what you're, I'm going to direct you to some images. And when you take the cursor for a computer over a digital image, as an example, this image gives the dimensions, gives the date the picture taken is. 10.10.05 at 3.18 p.m. Camera model, it indicates Canon PowerShot A310 to JPEG image and the size of that. Are you familiar with the taking or production of digital photography that those kind of details are provided right in the image itself? Do you understand the question? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Absolutely true. They are. Unless you get a 10 or 15 or $20 digital camera, the nicer cameras, even the smaller ones, will do that automatically in their programming for that. All right. Same question I have asked another witness, and I, I will ask you, Mr. Pierce. After the, well, really, after the 29th of October, 2005, had you ever heard or spoken to, 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 to Teresa Halbach? No. That's all I have for this witness, Judge. Thank you. Mr. Strang. Mr. Pierce, the Teresa Halbach you know was someone you described once as feisty? Well, depends on how you mean feisty. How did you mean it? full of energy. Someone who is in good shape and could fight back? I would think so. She carried a cell phone regularly? I'm sorry? I, I can't hear you. She carried a cell phone regularly? As far as I know, yes. That was her lifeline. But that wasn't something she would hook on a belt or do one of those things. She would keep it in her purse. Well, most of the time when I would see her, she would have it out of her purse and um, on the counter. If she were out somewhere, though, the cell phone was always in her purse. I think you have said before. I couldn't answer that 100%. I think so. She was in her car. Maybe it would be on the driver's seat. I know it went with her wherever she went. And when she was at Pierce Photography, she frequently would leave the cell phone out on the counter. If she was out somewhere else, it was in her purse, typically. That was your experience with her? Well, I know when she was at work, it was always out in the open on the counter. But like this picture sitting here? Because that was her business line. When she was out, out of the office, out of the studio, I really don't know what she did with her cell phone. I'm going to show you a report of an interview that you had with an agent named Alan 
Hunsader. Do you remember talking with him? Sure. I'm going to offer it as an exhibit. I'm just hoping it might refresh your recollection about the cell phone. I invite you to look at the last paragraph on that page. Just see yourself. Yeah, I guess. Does that help? Yeah. Refresh your recollection about your experience with Teresa Harbeck and her cell phone. When we would shoot a wedding together, she would have her cell phone in her purse. Through her, when, when we would go to, uh, give an example, we did a lot of work in a park, which was five minutes away from us, doing weddings. Even in her training time, she would keep her cell phone in her purse. That was my oversight. You described it as her lifeline just a few mo minutes ago. Right. Was that the only number you had for her? Yes. You don't know whether she had a landline phone in her home? I don't think so. You were aware that she evidently shared her cell phone number with all tow trader customers. I knew at one time she said to me that she was able to get out, give out her business cards to the auto trader. So in that respect, I guess, yeah, because her cell phone number would be on that. And indeed there was, there were at least a few occasions on which you were aware that she was getting calls on her cell phone from customers or dissatisfied customers of auto trader. And she would refer to those, refer those to the auto trader office. She mentioned to me a couple times that people were calling her direct. They had a problem with auto trader or whatever the case may be. She said, don't bother me. Call the auto trader office. Yes, sir. What, what day was it? As best as you can recall. And I'm going to chase the time to... If you can, that your first you first called Teresa's cell phone the week of October thirty first and found the voice mailbox full. I think it would have been Tuesday afternoon, and that somewhere in that time period. And the voice mailbox was full. Yes. Okay, and then Wednesday before this marketing group luncheon. After she didn't show up, did you try that again? Yes, sir. Still full voice mailbox? Still full. And if I understood you correctly, you said you tried again Thursday. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. So full voice box Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday? I believe I'm almost positive all three times because I thought that was very unusual. Starting Tuesday, mid-afternoon. Yes, sir. This studio, it was your studio, but she was sharing space, if I understood you? Yes. Correctly? Yes. Keys, keys to the studio, one, more than one? She had a set of keys, yes, sir. What is a set of keys meaning to the studio? Well, as myself, uh, we always carry two so that, uh, I mean, it's, it's the same key, but in case we drop it, and Teresa had a funny thing about not losing her keys, but misplacing her keys all the time. So I gave her two, one to put on her keychain and one to put in her purse somewhere. So she always had it. So two keys. If she mislaid the keychain? Yes. Okay. So the office key was one of the keys on that keychain? I would think so. Is it a keychain you saw? I'm sorry? Is it a keychain that you ever saw? Laying on the counter or something? Yes. Okay. It had a number of keys on it. I would think maybe uh, three or four. Okay. About 
three weeks before she disappeared, Theresa Holbach, you were aware, had been getting a lot of telephone calls that she was not answering on the cell phone. Yes, sir. They would leave no message. If you're referring to the same thing, I think she was standing almost right next to me in a day and she got this phone call and she looked at it and went, said, oh, not them again or not him again and just kind of forgot about it. She looked a little upset, so I questioned her a little bit about this and she told me, just forget about it. Somebody keeps calling her all different hours, a nuisance call. And that was about two or three weeks. And she had mentioned that she had been getting them for a while. And I, I had said, well, why don't you give me that number and I will call and find out instead of her dealing with it. And she said, no, don't worry about it. But that's, I think, what you're talking about. Right. And whatever the number was that came up on the on the phone, she recognized it? Yeah, she knew what it was, but she wouldn't let me know. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Kratz? Just one area of inquiry, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Pierce, would you have considered yourself as long or together with a mentor, being a friend of Teresa's? A good friend and a good colleague, yes. In that regard, had you ever admonished or warned Teresa about her behavior if she was alone with somebody in a home? Relevance. Mr. Cross? Judge, it actually will be relevant to the false imprisonment charge the issue of being restrained or confined. If admonished by an individual that that shouldn't occur, it goes to that particular element of that offense. Mr. Strang? I don't know that we ought to be arguing the point here. I'm not at all convinced of the relevance. I don't know about the relevance, but I think it's the scope of redirect. I'm going to sustain an objection. We can't hear the court. It's beyond the scope of redirect. I'm abstaining the objection. That's all I have of Mr. Pierce then, Judge. Thank you. Excused. Could we approach just briefly, Judge? Sure. For the benefit of the jurors, I informed counsel that I really didn't want to go beyond 4 today. I'm aware of the fact that you have not only been sitting in the jury box most of the day, but also the fact that there's travel to and from Manitoba each day. So unless it is really important, I'm going to do the best to get you out of here at 4.30 all the time. But I have been told there is a witness who isn't going to take very long, so Mr. Kratz, you may call your witness. Thank you, Judge. We call David Beach to the stand. Please raise your right hand. Please be seated. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. <laughs> My name is David Beach. My last name is spelled B-E-A-C-H. Mr. Beach, I'm going to ask you to get a little closer to the microphone. Mr. Beach, do you know a woman by the name of Teresa Habak? Yes, I did. How did you know her? She was my cousin. Sometime on Friday, the 4th of November, did you volunteer to assist in a search for Teresa? Yes. And in that regard, were you with someone else or paired up with somebody in that search? I was paired with my older sister, Sarah Beach. On Friday, the 4th of November, did you make any stops or what was your, or what did your search efforts entail? I met up with my sister and our search effort was to look for her vehicle. So we got information from the hall box about what her schedule was, where she had 
the area that she was going to, and we just tried to track down the Toyota. All right. In that effort, Mr. Beach, did you find your way to the Avery Salvage Yard property? Yes. And could you tell the jury, please, what occurred once you got to that property? We came to the property. I was the passenger in the vehicle. I stepped out, I went into the garage. There was a lone desk. There was a person sitting at the desk talking on the phone. Another person came to the desk to greet me. And then at that time point, I asked the person if, if they ever had any photographs come to, photographers come to the salvage yard to take pictures of vehicles. And he said he didn't know. And then I came back and I mentioned that my cousin was missing. She was a photographer. And that was the reason for my visit. All right. Let me ask you, Mr. Beach, do you know the defendant, Stephen Avery, the gentleman seated in the courtroom today? At the time, I did not. Today, I do. When you got to the salvage yard on the 5th of, excuse me, on the 4th of November, that Friday, was Stephen Avery one of the people that you talked to at the office or in what you call the garage? Yes, he was the second person. Did you specifically ask Mr. Avery whether or not your cousin, Teresa, had been at the salvage yard? Yes. And what did Mr. Avery tell you? He said she... He said that she was there roughly about two in the afternoon. All right, just back up a second. Mr. Avery himself told you that Teresa was there that day or the day that she had come to take pictures? Yes. At two o'clock in the afternoon, right? Yes. This would have been three days after her appearance there. Is that right? Yes, this was a Friday. Okay. Mr. Avery, give you any more details about what Teresa had done while at the property? He told me that she was there. There was a vehicle behind the office garage and she was taken to the vehicle to be photographed. That was about, that was her purpose for being there. Let me ask you, Mr. Beach, upon your stopping at this auto trader, or excuse me, at the Avery Salvage Lot, did you provide any information or any literature to the, either Mr. Avery himself or to the Avery Salvage business? No, I did not. How long was it that you discussed your cousin with Mr. Avery? Five minutes. Finally, Mr. Beach, did Mr. Avery know who you were talking about? In other words, did he indicate whether or not this woman had been there before? Yes, I described her build, her what she looked like, what she drove, and he confirmed all that. And he confirmed that she was there to take photographs. Had she been there before? Had she been there before? Did he tell you? Yes. What did he say, if you can remember? In my line of questioning about my cousin, she was missing. He said that, yes, Teresa Halbach came there on a regular basis. So that the jury is very clear, Mr. Beach. After that five minute, that brief contact with Mr. Avery, did you return to the Avery Salvage property or did you have any other conversation with Mr. Avery? No. That's all I have of this witness then, Judge. Mr. Buting. Thank you, Judge. Now, Mr. Beach, do you know what time it was that you came to see Mr. Avery at the Avery Salvage Yard? About four. On Friday afternoon? Yes. And by that time, of course, there have been reports about your sister in the media, right? 
I'm sorry, your cousin with the media about her being missing and all of that? I do not know. I did not hear that. So you didn't see any of the news reports about your cousin? Correct. Okay. So how was it that you ended up at the Avery salvage lot? Friday morning, I received a phone call from my parents. They told me about my cousin Teresa was missing. I Later that afternoon, I came up. I met with my sister. We then got information from the Hobart. After that, we just drove around and we started from Michigan and we worked our way north. Okay. My question, I guess, is did somebody give you information about what her appointments were that day? The hall box told me the general area she had work, work in, and but they did not give me any idea of where her stops were. So no one told you that she had an appointment on Monday the 31st at Avery Salvage Lot Yard? Correct. You just stumbled on that? Yeah, by incident. It was incidental. Okay. And when you got there, Stephen Avery, the person sitting to my left, who you know, now know, came up and seemed concerned about what you were asking about, right? Yes. Seemed calm? Correct. Did not appear to be holding anything back? No. Correct? Correct. In fact, I think you described him as being very forthright, didn't you? Correct. Expressing genuine concern about, you know, what happened to your cousin? Objection, Judge. Cause for speculation. How genuine it may be. Well, he can testify as to his impression. He said that he was concerned. Okay, and you accepted that? Yes. And he told you you described his vehicle, I'm sorry, you described her vehicle, the RAV4? Yes. And he said, yes, I do recall she was driving that. And she came, he actually said she came sometime mid-afternoon, didn't he? Yes, he said that she was at the, his garage, salvage yard around two o'clock. But he actually, he qualified that by saying approximately mid-afternoon? Correct. Okay, wasn't exact on the time? Correct. And he said that she didn't take, that she did take photos of the vehicle, right? Correct. And that he did not know her next stop, right? Yes. And he told you that when the RAV4 pulled out of the driveway, that it went to the left from the Avery property? Correct. All right, I have no further questions. Thank you. Anything else? Very well, you are excused. Members of the jury, that's going to conclude the court proceedings for today. I will remind you again not to discuss the case with anyone before we resume tomorrow, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Council. I would just ask that tomorrow morning, the attorneys meet in chambers at 8.20 before the day begins, just to let me know what's coming. What time did you say the jury is coming? 8.45? Okay, meet at 8.30. We'll find out from experience what time they normally get here. I believe you are right. Meet at 8.30. Excuse me, Judge. Did you want me to take up that other matter today or tomorrow morning? I have a number of other matters listed. I'm not sure which one you want, but we'll discuss that tomorrow morning. All right. 